Hello and welcome to this Cisco Meraki Masterclass video. In this masterclass, we will be talking and learning about Cisco Meraki Cloud, the Meraki Dashboard, Meraki MX Firewalls, the Meraki MR Access Points, Meraki MS Switches, and Meraki Systems Manager. In all of these modules, we'll be talking about the overall architecture, design, initial configuration, deployment, and best practices. This is a mini course which is based out of a full-fledged Meraki course that we have on Udemy which is about 13 hours long which includes 10 sections and about 84 lectures which dives into much deeper elements of the Meraki Cloud, Dashboard, MX, uh, Standard Configuration, Ideal Deployment, Best Practices and all of that stuff. So if you're interested to learn more about that, head over to Udemy um, through the link given in the description below. Before we dive into further, let us take a step back and really understand the current networking challenges that we have on a day-to-day -day basis today. To start off with, we've all heard about this word called cloud computing. Everywhere we go in our current industry, everywhere we see, everybody's talking about cloud, cloud, cloud. Whether if it's infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, or software as a service. Earlier, it was kind of uh, an option for an organization to go into cloud, but today it's uh, a bread and butter and an absolute requirement for everybody to shift in the cloud. Now, this has taken uh, a toll on a typical network engineer, right? So earlier, we used to have a lot of heavy on-prem infrastructure, right? So there was a lot of money that is invested into on-prem infrastructure that you have a huge routing equipment firewalls and things like that but with the adoption of cloud now you have all of your data all of your services living up here right so all of your on-prem devices suddenly have become useless so if your devices are on-prem so consider this one and this one is your device on-prem you have heavy equipment down here to inspect traffic, to intercept flows, routing implementation, and things like that. Now, all of a sudden, all of your data is in the cloud. How do you protect and secure, and also at the same time, manage all of this data, applications, platforms that are in the cloud? So, you need to have software-defined networks or software-defined networking. At the same time, you need to have virtual networking. Now, this is a pretty hot kick at the moment, and you need to make sure that you have adequate skills around SDN and VN, which is software defined networking and virtual networking in order to protect and keep up with today's cloud computing workloads, right? So this is the prime challenge in a day-to-day -day network engineer's life, wherein they need to keep up with cloud computing and the boom around IAS, PAAS, or SAAS. Moving on to the next one is we have ever increasing business applications, all right? So now you have SAP, you have Oracle, databases, whether on-prem or in the cloud. So it doesn't really matter. You have Salesforce, you have Hootsuite, you have different marketing applications, financial applications, and everybody is in the race, right? So it's a constant race of implementing better solutions, faster solutions, and application-driven approach. So you need to have capacity, right? A proper capacity plan. And also at the same time, you need to make sure that all of these applications are faster they are responsive and all of your users are happy right so better user experience now when you say user experience and faster delivery now we are talking about content delivery networks we are also talking something about sd van right wherein businesses are cutting the cost and implementing cheaper circuits like a broadband circuits at their offices and no longer using things like MPLS, right? We're gonna have a look at SD-WAN later and briefly talk about what this is. 
and everybody wants all of their apps to be faster they need to be prioritized they need to be readily available not only on prem but also on the move and people are also working from home so traditional approach of having on prem infrastructure has just vanished right so it's no longer there we need to be agile and we need to be dynamic v as in networking people now this is the second greatest challenge on networking and how it keeps everybody on the networking areas on their toes right so this is our second challenge so we'll quickly take this off and moving on to the third one which is you have countless mobile devices right so they are working from home they're connecting from on the move now and when i say connecting they're connecting through the cloud through the different apps right directly and nobody is inspecting this traffic or it is not managed so we need to make sure that all of these devices that you deploy on your corporate environment whether if it's a business device or if it's a personal phone or a personal tablet and we call this BYOD so this type of networking challenge we need to address at the very first step it is because if this mobile device is stolen your precious data is also stolen so that puts your organization at risk and you can imagine what a nightmare for a networking person that would be right moving on to the fourth challenge the biggest one is now the backhauling of network traffic now consider for example this is your headquarters so i'll call this hq and let's say this is your office one and this is office number two if the users out here or here want to exchange information and connect to the internet traditionally what you used to do is have like an internet circuit out here backhaul everything from this office to the hq and from the hq that traffic used to go out on the internet now you can imagine we talked about increasing business apps like sap and things like that right so i'll just put down two of them sap and oracle so your erp and database systems if they are let's say on aws they need to start from your office one flow into your hq get that traffic inspected through your security tools like firewalls ips and whatever you have and then it would go out to aws or azure or any other cloud that you're using so you can imagine you are introducing latency you are increasing the the time that it takes for the apps to be responsive so you are now decreasing user experience so your ceo all your c level people directors and everybody in your organization would be disappointed and they would say our networking team is not doing an adequate job for helping us out in making sure that we have fast access so your backhauling this is what it is called like your all of your traffic from your office moves to your hq first and then it goes out so this is a biggest challenge and a biggest hurdle so people are moving directly into sd wan all right and with sd wan they want to have direct internet connection so everybody from here needs to go out directly to the cloud to have better user experience lower application response time and users are happy and also at the same time they need to decrease the cost of the internet circuits that they put out here all right moving on to the next challenge which is administrators are now overwhelmed so you can imagine this is yourself in the office you already broken one arm and you already have a lot of headaches because all of your current challenges and you all of a sudden get a lot of tickets you get phone calls because we have this cloud boom increasing business applications increasing mobile devices so it's very hard for us to keep up right so we need a solution which is scalable dynamic and also at the same time decrease all of these efforts that we have or overhead that we have and lastly all of these challenges if they are not addressed we're going to have more system outages 
more users frustrated and we cannot really function and we cannot really keep up with right so we need a dynamic solution so enter meraki cloud or meraki solution as we call it so this is a complete cloud managed it solution so you don't need to have on prem heavy focus infrastructure you can manage this from anywhere right from your home or even if you are traveling on a flight or in a car i mean if you're in a flight you would need to have internet access so as long as you have internet access you can manage all of your network infrastructure right so this is a big check they have wireless switching security iot everything so from a single vendor you get all of your solutions and business requirements solved they're heavily into sd wan endpoint management that is your mobile devices so with the meraki solution you solve the problem of the ever increasing business apps your cloud boom your adoption for cloud the ever increasing mobile devices so all of those challenges are solved through meraki all of your meraki devices have hardware and software integrations so you can integrate meraki solutions with other providers other solutions any other cisco stuff that you have you can integrate that with cisco meraki so you have better interworking so you can do advanced stuff like automation and scripting cloud services is delivered through one click of a button we're going to have a look at this later it also supports layer 7 detection so you can have visibility security and your entire network would be monitored through one single pane of glass Cisco Meraki is a leader in cloud IT management, right? Or they are a leader in cloud managed IT. And these guys make some of the best networking solutions that I've ever seen. And it's the fastest growing Cisco portfolio, so it is adopted by small businesses and mid-sized segments heavily, right? Because it is simple, scalable, and secure. Continuing down the list, the meraki solution we're going to spend a little more time and try to understand some of the summarized features that it provides all right so the very first and the greatest point about the meraki solution is called zero touch provisioning and what this means is you don't need to have network experts like a ccie or any other networking expert in order to configure this like back in the day we used to have routers that need to be configured through command line there were like route maps policy maps and many many other complicated stuff and configurations that uh a network engineer would need to uh put in before provisioning it however as compared to the meraki solutions all of their switching firewall equipment and any other devices that they sell they come with zero touch provisioning feature wherein even if a sales guy can connect the hardware to your internet connectivity or plug in the cables you can provision on and configure this entire solution through the cloud even if you're sitting half way across the world all right so we don't need network experts to provision meraki solutions what this means is it saves a lot of time and resources now how does it do that now you don't need experts to configure it right so If you are shipping your devices let's say from Europe to some of your office locations in Asia Pacific earlier what we used to do is when we have devices that are done this way some guy or the other or your network engineer would actually fly into this location right they would go to their site they would set up this equipment they would put it in the rack and then they would come back to the original location so this will be flying as well and also at the same time you have a lot of cost around travel so you need to pay for your hotel fees your food and any other provisioning that you have so this comes at a very high cost now this is only for your engineers or anybody who is actually setting this up now what about uh the other approach right so the other approach is folks would actually have all of the equipment delivered to the office where your network engineers are so for example if they are in europe 
all of your equipment will come to Europe. They would first provision, configure it, set it up, and then they will ship it again to your Asia Pacific office. So that actually comes again at a higher price because you have to ship that products once again. The second issue is that um, once you have this equipment configured and shipped, the issue that comes in is time related. And what do I mean by time? You get your equipment out here, you configure it, you set up, and then you ship it. And this will also create some kind of an overhead in shipping time. So you lose a lot of precious time. So there is business outage or business has to bear that cost with respect to time and they are shipping. So they, they may lose on customer orders and things like that. So you need to have this chain broken and uh, decrease the time that it takes to provision the solutions for your networking requirements, right? So Meraki exactly helps us to do that. So it helps us to save time and resources by complementing this zero touch provisioning. All right. So you have high degree of accuracy and no misconfigurations because everything is done through your cloud dashboard. So there's no need of typing in complex command line interface commands, right? You don't need to put all those complicated route maps, policy maps, access lists through command line, right? Which is more prone to errors, right? So if you miss some degree of the other, like a command that you type in incorrectly and ship it out, that could also cause a lot of issues uh, wherein you have to reconfigure it and things like that. So Meraki solution is very highly accurate because it is provisioned through the cloud and all of those commands are completely eliminated. It is just a graphical user interface that you need to just click through and get your work done. It is super, super scalable wherein you have a single pane of glass, wherein you have a single dashboard. All right, if I can draw this D properly, my apologies there. So it's a single dashboard and as and as and when your offices increase or if your devices increase, you don't need to plan for capacity. You just need to plug those devices to your network and they will hook up to your dashboard. So all of the storage, all of the data that is stored, the logs, the previous history, if you want to look at, you don't need to spend at a logging solution and things like that. So it is pretty super scalable and for your capacity planning. The Meraki solution and the products that they come with, they have a lot of feature rich things like APIs or application programming interfaces, wherein you can leverage this and tie Meraki with other providers. Like for example, if you have invested in Cisco umbrella, you have a built in native integration with Meraki and Umbrellas, so you can leverage Umbrellas greatest features through the Meraki solution. Same with the other, you can write in Python scripts and hook up through some of the APIs to pull in information that you want and perform advanced analytics and different tasks that you would like to automate. So this is a cool feature. Meraki is 100% supporting in your SD-WAN deployment or direct internet access. The challenge that we talked about for uh, completely eliminating backhauls, backhaul network traffic, right? And decreasing cost of your deployment. So SD-WAN is 100% supported in Meraki. And it is a very simple solution, right? So it offers you a graphical user interface so you can use that to deploy. You don't need to remember complex Cisco commands like the way we used to remember for Cisco routers and uh, switches uh, if you had worked on them back in the day. So it is a simple to use solution and easy to manage. We're gonna have a look at this in more details later. So this was just uh, a summarization of all the features that's in store in Meraki solutions. Now a quick disclaimer, all of the features that we just talked about, 
they come at a cost and you need to balance it out with your requirements so always make sure that your business requirement right so business requirement matches or it is equal to your tech requirements nothing less nothing short you don't want to put a super 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 expensive and um a cutting edge technology when you have a very small business right so if you have five users in an organization you don't need to put in like a nexus 9k switch right for their switching requirements so you need to make sure that your business requirements and your tech requirements are met on the same ground miraki solution is optimal right when you say optimal use it with very caution so miraki is a solution that is optimal for small to mid size businesses right so this is my take on it after working on miraki solutions extensively so it is good for like small businesses that have offices it's good for campus level de- deployment like if you have office like let's say the smallest to smallest office so it could be like a doctor's office so a doctor has a clinic and um he or she needs to manage the network remotely they can certainly use miraki and put it out there it could be multiple offices like a business is there like uh, that have sales offices let's say all right so they have let's say 10 to 20 sales offices spread across different geo locations they can use cisco miraki and when i say campus it's like a school campus or a college university so you have multiple buildings at the uh in a pretty widespread area of land and you have uh many many users out here so they can use miraki solution if we have a very very large enterprise right and when i say enterprise so let's make a separate section for them so enterprise requirements and the way they deploy things are very complex right and when i say complex it doesn't mean that this is bad uh complexity essentially means that it needs to be heavily tuned it needs to be heavily customized right and what do i mean by customized is that so in a school you'd have children that are studying in different classes right so in here you pro- predominantly have uh children teachers and maybe some staff that is helping out in the school however in an enterprise you have different customers that you are dealing with let's say you have healthcare you have manufacturing you f- you have let's say pharmaceuticals right so all of these have their own distinct requirements and you cannot really have a solution that is pretty straightforward to their needs it needs to be customized as per their requirements and it needs to be tweaked to a level that you have to be flexible right so you need to have all the bells and whistles so you need to have all of these tools under your arsenal in order to tweak the networking devices as per your requirement so miraki solutions they are only good for small to mid sized businesses wherein they are designed with simplicity into consideration right so these are simple solutions these are zero touch provision solutions that you can deploy at a smaller footprint of a location i would highly recommend to not use miraki solution in a very very large enterprise like if you have like a 10 billion dollar company that is having multiple data centers multiple campuses multiple offices across all over the world so this can actually lead to a lot of frustration because you need to have a lot of customization you need to have a lot of uh, bells and whistles with respect to features and functionalities that you can tweak and tune that you cannot do with miraki uh, products for example so let's say i have a miraki firewall which is an mx and compare it with your counterpart so enterprise level solution like a cisco ftd or firepower threat defense right so with this i can write my custom intrusion rules right and i can push them out on this device although miraki mx devices support intrusion detection 
you can turn on and off certain rules. You cannot write your own custom rules and deploy it out here. There is no such thing as a command line that will offer you out here to deploy all of that. So this is just one um, scenario. Similarly, if you wanted to apply some custom route maps to route traffic and uh, have like SLAs tied to different uh, paths and things like that, you cannot do it out on Meraki MX devices or the, any of the equipment. You can do it out here. So that is what I mean by um, Meraki is more suitable for small businesses to mid-sized businesses which focus on simplicity and scalability into consideration if they don't have complex requirements. So the last point is just to emphasize that Meraki solution is only optimal for small businesses that focus on simplicity, right? In an enterprise that focus on heavy customization and tuning of their needs, um, you need to go with the enterprise level stuff like the firepower threat defenses in their um, enterprise level segment of products. In this lecture, we're going to talk about Meraki Cloud. So Meraki Cloud is nothing but a suite of servers, platforms, software and tools that Cisco Meraki provides all of their customers to manage their Meraki equipment. And if you look at the right side out here, so we don't know what the cloud is, right? So we don't know if they are on Azure, AWS, hybrid, on-prem, uh, or any other mix and match of cloud deployment. So they have all of their servers in their own cloud. So we don't have to manage and deploy servers on our premises. So Meraki has their own servers locked down in their data centers. So they have multiple data centers across the world and the dashboard service runs through the Meraki cloud. All right. So all of these servers spread across the multiple geo locations and different data centers. They have all of these platforms, services and dashboard related components running on their Meraki cloud. Now, this is a centralized management platform. So from a single place, you can manage all of your devices that are spread across the world. All right. And this is multi-tenant. All right. So your Meraki cloud actually splits up your control plane and data plane. So it provides a very, very effective out of band control plane. If there's a firmware corruption or any other issues that happen on the data plane, you can still manage them through the control plane that is isolated and out of band. And it is very highly effective. Now, what happens is you have all of your devices that are deployed at your various offices, campus, right? And these are then synced up to the cloud over the internet, right? So this link that you see out here is established through the internet. You don't need to have any tunnels or security or any private circuits set up. So plain internet is all it takes to connect these devices to the Meraki cloud securely. Now, all of these devices use uh, SSL or TLS to connect to the cloud because internet is untrusted, right? So you need to make sure that the data that is passing through is secure and encrypted. And as you can imagine, since this is multi-tenant, each of the customers or each of the clients that have devices that register to the Meraki cloud, they get like a separate chunk of services or pools, as we call it, allocated to them. And they have various organizations and networks, which you're going to talk about in just a moment, dedicated to them. So each customer gets his own network and organization. So the data is segregated that way. From the Meraki cloud, all of your configs, data, logs, everything is stored out here. So if you make any changes to the device, you basically do the change out here. All right. And that change is then pulled down through the management plane or the, uh, the control plane and applied it to the end device. So you never make changes directly. So you can compare this to like a Cisco switch wherein you SSH 
and make the changes. So this method is not permitted in Cisco Meraki. Right? All of the changes has to be done on the dashboard uh, in the Meraki cloud and they would be pulled down by the device and applied. All right. And Meraki cloud is pretty secure, reliable and scalable. And what do I mean by that is it is residing in Cisco data centers. So they take good care of physical security, right? Who has access, con all right, access control, who has access to the devices, servers and stuff. It is highly reliable and I've never seen any downtime so far in my five year uh, career with Cisco Meraki deployments and stuff. So they, I think they have an SLA of 99.99%. So it's pretty reliable and it is also scalable. And what do I mean by that is today, if you have three offices and after five years, you decide to go with 30 offices, you can simply purchase these end devices and deploy it at various locations. And all of these devices would seamlessly connect to the cloud without having any issues and without you providing any backend infrastructure, right? So it is highly scalable, secure and reliable. Now here is the breakdown of the Meraki cloud architecture and what it is made up of the different components and stuff. So at the left on top here, you have your Meraki cloud, which we just spoke about and each Meraki cloud instance or data center is made up of a node, right? So you have your global data centers that are spread across different geolocations. So let's say this is in America let's say North America, NAM, let's say this is South America and let's say this is Europe, Asia Pacific and uh, let's say this is in greater China, right? And the uh, Eastern regions. So you have all of these data centers that are spread across the different geolocations. So if you have like a failure at one location out here, you still have many other nodes and data centers readily available between the regions, right? So even in Asia Pacific, they would have multiple data centers. So if you have one data center failure here, they would fall back to the other ones located within the same cluster. That is same with Europe, North America, South America, and Greater China. And even if you have like a full blown geo outage, right? So if the entire EU, EU region crashes, they can be moved into North America and the other locations. Each of the data centers have their own redundant servers. So if you have an outage within a data center, which, which is like a single uh, physical location, uh, it has replicated data and it can uh, fall back to your secondary servers that are running through a hot standby method or if they're running together uh, parallelly and managed through a load balancer and things like that. So we don't know the end customers. Uh, we don't know the details about that, how it is done, but this is the way it actually uh, markets and sells. This is the way Cisco Meraki depicts how they uh, manage that data and have their infrastructure set up because we as client are only using the dashboard, right? So we just use their software platform. So we do not manage the data centers, servers, and what runs behind the scenes. So we're just interested to run our dashboard. So each of the servers that you see out here has segregated organizations. So organizations, what it means is you have individual customers, right? So let's say SecureWire, that is our company has Meraki devices deployed. So we'll be getting or provisioned with one organization. This can be containerized, virtualized. So we don't know, but it is segregated between other organizations. So let's say this splice is for me. And let's say there's company XYZ. So they would be also getting a splice of one of their compute or platforms. So this is the way that the cloud architecture is deployed and how it is made up of. So to quickly summarize, you have this multi-tenant environment. So a single platform supports multiple clients. It is globally redundant. So you have 
uh, data centers in North America, Europe, Asia, and China. And these are the actual, at the moment, data center locations that is as of December 2021. So you have all of their major North America data centers in the USA. For EU, they have it in Germany, Asia, it's in Australia and Singapore. In China, it's within China itself. And all of the devices communicate through the cloud and the initiation of the communication is through the cloud first. All right. And before even deploying devices, you can load up configurations, set up devices in the cloud so that they can be kept ready. And when the devices are just connected and registered, they can just simply pull down the configurations from the cloud. And lastly, the devices, that's your end device. They only store the last known good configuration. And if something were to happen or connectivity is broken, uh, it can just uh, restore from your last known configuration. Let's quickly understand how the remote procedure calls and how it actually works with the dashboard. That is the Meraki hardware devices. So towards the left, you have all of your Meraki devices, access points, switches, firewalls. So they make event driven remote procedure calls, right? So when you say event driven, it means that I change a configuration. Let's say I change an IP address. I change a subnet. I change a policy. So all of these are called events. So if there's something happening, then there is a, a RPC or remote procedure call that is triggered. All right. That is bi-directional, but initially it is done from dashboard through the device, right? And in the Meraki cloud or in the Meraki data centers, they have the LLDP modules, probing clients modules, and other various modules that are responsible for taking care of different services, like for radius, for LDAP, and many other functionalities, all right? So these modules take care of all that functionality and all of that data is stored in Meraki database servers. So all of this communication is bi-directional and the Meraki cloud and the Meraki dashboard, each of them have various modules or functions that are performed by specific units, a modular architecture. So it's not a monolithic system. So each functionality that you wanted to deploy on your Meraki devices is handled by specific modules and specific system. Now, here is a slide uh, that I put together that are related to the service requirements, right? So what do you need to have when it comes to minimum requirements from your network in order to connect to Meraki cloud? So as you can see, you have your source which is your network and this is your local network, right? Which is on-premise. And this is the destination, which is your internet or any other service. So this could be internet. It could be DNS. It could be Meraki cloud or any destination that your local devices want to connect to. Now, these are your Meraki cloud IP addresses. All right. And this port 7351 over UDP outbound from your local network to the Meraki cloud is essential and it should be open in order to have effective Meraki cloud communications. And this is for all of the devices that are present in your local network. All right. So if you have like a firewall in between your Meraki device, like if you have a Meraki access point, right, and that connects through let's say this is your Palo Alto firewall and let's say this is your Meraki cloud or you can just call this www or internet so if your Palo Alto firewall is doing content inspection and web inspection and providing internet access only to specific IP addresses or specific domains you need to make sure that this access point can connect to the Meraki cloud over 7351 to all of these uh, subnets, right? So which are related to Meraki data centers. Then you also have VPN registry. 
right to initiate and form vpn related connections over 9351 and 9350 to these public endpoints in order to have vpns established from access points or your mx appliances uh, don't worry about this we're gonna look at vpns later all right so if you have api related integrations so this is the fqdn that you need to allow api.meraki.com over tls that is 443 tcp and you have uh, these ports related to systems manager and these two services are related to your meraki sm or your systems manager that they need to communicate for or so this is for your ios devices and the bottom one is for android devices so again very important all of your devices need to have outbound internet connectivity or port 80 and 443 and this is for things like amp systems lookups agent communications flash pages cloud archives and things like that and this one that you see out here uh, it's a big list and these have a lot of custom ports down here for tcp and this is especially used for upstreaming downstreaming communication of backups inside information log related information and things like that so you need to have access to these ip addresses over these ports we'll be attaching this as a, a document so you can reference it later all right and you have one service for radius for 802.1x communication obviously it needs ntp for time synchronization and also dns and other uplink connectivity testing right for google that it comes by default or cisco umbrella so this is a very high level system requirements overview we'll be attaching this as a slide so you can reference it and have better communications and make sure that the required ports and services are open when it comes to meraki cloud communications in this lecture, we are going to talk about Miraki dashboard and we are going to do a lot more deeper dive. What is the dashboard, what you can do with it and how you do it. All right. So as you can see towards the left side, this is just a snippet or the screenshot of a dashboard, what it looks like. And it is a simple graphical user interface. There's no command line involved. So it is just point and click and drag and drop and it is accessed through your web browser and all of these services for Meraki dashboards are located in the Meraki cloud that Cisco Meraki manages. It is the heart of everything. So all of your configuration changes, modifications, firmware upgrades, everything from start to finish is done on the dashboard. It simply requires internet connectivity and this is the best feature about that. So let's say if this is Cisco Meraki cloud, and let's say these are your devices that are present at your data center. And these communicate to the cloud. And let's say you are chilling at home in the evening, Saturday night, and something goes wrong, right? And you need to troubleshoot and uh, determine what the issue is. Traditionally, what happens is if the device was broken, even if you VPN into this location, you will not be able to have access to it. But with Meraki Cloud, what happens is since it's the mediator or broker of connection, you can simply log in to Meraki Cloud over the internet and you can have access to it and try to figure out what's going wrong, right? When it uh, lost connectivity, uh, what exactly happened, the Meraki Cloud would actually show you all that information through the dashboard. So uh, if you see out here, uh, there's a snippet, how many devices are there. So if you see wireless device down you'll be able to know that your access points are no longer working all right so you just need to have internet connectivity in order to have access to your devices through the meraki dashboard all of this configuration is done through the dashboard only so you don't have access to your local devices and meraki dashboard needs to be set up first before you deploy any devices because the dashboard takes care of all of your configuration, licensing, right from the start to finish. 
And to get started with the dashboard, you first create your organization. Those, so this is step number one. And we talked about organization. This is nothing but like a small chunk or a slice that you get in a multi-tenant environment. So let's say this, this outer box is your Meraki server in the cloud, right? So let's say this is a server, a single server. So a single server can house multiple organization and these can be logically separated from one another. And this organization can be yours. This could be somebody else's, right? So this is completely multi-tenant. And in order to get started up with your Meraki devices and have traffic flowing, you need to make sure that you have an organization created first and then you create your networks right so organization would in turn have networks you can have multiple networks within one organization right but you cannot have multiple organization within one network so this is one way relationship and the third step is that you register devices to your network right so this is a hierarchy from top to down we'll have a look at this in more details now so this is, let's say, a typical slice of your dashboard. All right. So in the middle, you have your dashboard account, which is dedicated to you, a single slice for you. You can have two or more organizations that you maintain. And this is especially useful for things like MSSP, right? So you have a managed services provider or MSP. They maintain multiple organization or if you have a single organization, you have this. So you have this entity tied to your dashboard account and under each organization, you have multiple networks and networks are nothing but the site. So let's say this is in Boston and this could be in California. So this is just like a logical separation. It doesn't mean that this network has to be present in Boston or this network has to be in California. It is just a logical separation for you to know that you have two sites, right? One in Boston and one in California, where each of these have devices that connect to the networks that are tied to the organization. So your dashboard account or your Meraki dashboard is tied to an email address. And this is like a primary entity. So one email address can have access to only one dashboard account. All right. You cannot have one email address uh, to multiple dashboard accounts. Each of these email addresses are unique to one dashboard account. If you wanted to have access to various organizations, the organization from this needs to explicitly allow your email address to communicate to their other organization. All right. So organizations contain your network information, licensing information, device related inventory, like the types of devices and stuff that you have. So organization is like your uh, company. All right. That has uh, all of the central repository configuration, everything done out here. And your networks are like an extended arm of your organization that keep a track of your client devices, statistics, configuration, your uh, logs, events, and things like that are taken care of by your network. Uh, each network can communicate with the other when you have devices down here. So let's say you have an MX here and MX here that are tied to different sites or different networks. They can communicate to one another by forming a VPN tunnel, right? Within the same organization or multiple organizations. We'll jump into a demo and we'll try to see how it looks and the different features that are available. What we'll do next is register our MX device or any other devices that we have on the dashboard. So we're going to click on register Meraki devices and click next. Now, 
the very first thing that we need to do is create ourselves an a network now a network ideally is um location of a place where your organization is located so if you have a branch office you would say uh secure wire branch 01 or you can just say secure wire corp office so things like this so i'm just going to keep it simple and name the secure wire and i'm going to say add devices and in here i need to key in the order numbers or the device serial numbers one line at a time right so what i'm going to do here is the devices that i had purchased which is my meraki mx uh meraki mr which is the access point and the switch i'm going to key in the serial numbers so that i can add them out here now these numbers you would find at the back of the devices and we already saw this in the physical uh review of the devices so i'm going to enter the serial number of the meraki mr access point and lastly i have my switch which is a meraki ms120 and i'm going to click this button add devices to add these up to my inventory all right and there you go i have my devices show up here and ready to go all right so now the next option is for me to create this network now i can select all of these or one or two of them if you wanted to you can just select the mx device which is a security appliance and you can add them if you had any other devices you can click on this button add devices repeat the same set of steps and then do the same all over again at the moment what i'll do is i'm going to add all of these into one single network which is secure wire so i'll go ahead and create network all right there you have it we didn't have all these options before which is security and sd wan switch and wireless now these are all showing up here and we don't have any data traffic passing in so we don't have any clients show up here as well now at the moment it is showing me an error out here saying that license is required because i have not yet claimed my license and that we're going to do in the next video at the moment we have successfully created ourselves a network we added the devices in our network successfully and we can verify that by going into organization in inventory and i have all my devices show up here all right next step is for us to assign these licenses otherwise they would not be able to pass any data traffic so things like that and what we can do is in the next video we'll be going ahead and assigning these licenses in this lecture we're going to have a deep dive demo on the meraki dashboard we're going to walk through the entire dashboard and we're going to figure out where you can find the various configuration items monitoring and other details so to kick start i can fire up my web browser and i can go to dashboard.meraki.com it would redirect me to this uh, account page where i can provide my credentials and login provide the email there at the second step it's going to ask me for the password so i'm going to key in my password as well and hit the login button to get in the dashboard and if that is successful it should take me to my organizational unit in dashboard and there we go now once we log in it takes us to this main home page where it kind of displays the health from a network standpoint right so we are by default on a network wide setup and under secure wire network so this gives me an overview of what my networks are so right at the top i see the health so uplinks one of one is healthy which is my wan interface 
uh, one MX is healthy, it's connected, and one wireless access point is connected as well, and it's healthy. What it means is all of these devices, MX and the wireless access point, MR, are both connected to the dashboard. They're passing traffic and clients are connected to them. If there was any issue, you would be uh, not seeing healthy out here and it would display some error or any other details. If you click on them, it would take you to the device. So I'll just click on that and it would show some additional detail. The name of the access point right here, it is secure wire AP, the MAC address, the model number, and the historic connectivity to the dashboard. So you can see out here, it was connected to the gateway or the dashboard. And then uh, at 12 a.m. 27th June, it disconnected right up until 10 in the morning. And then it uh, was back again online. So we'll dive into this later, but for now we'll go back. And down here, if you look at the other details, it shows you the different clients that were connected and it gives you a historic view for the last 24 hours. And it gives you a summary of the data that is transmitted. Like this is download and this is upload. It also gives you a brief snapshot of the different applications, right? So you can see utilization on YouTube, uh, other SSL sites, so Facebook, etc. And if you click this button, it would give you some additional details as a listing. So you can have a look at that, right? And underneath you have the list of clients and the names, when it was last seen, the usage, the OS that was detected, IP address that was assigned, and the policy that was assigned to the device. We're gonna have a look at these in more details later. So if you wanted to, you can click on this device to get some more information. So I'm going to click on this laptop. And if you look at this sign, if you see this kind of a wireless signal, it means that this device was connected over Wi-Fi. And this one shows as like a port. And this means uh, it was physically connected uh, via an Ethernet cable. All right, so if I click on one of this device, it would show me the previous history, connections, applications that were accessed, and many other details. So I can see, uh, as specific to this device, I can drill down into the last two hours, last 30 days, last week, and kind of get an overall snapshot of how much data it was consuming and stuff like that. So this is very important when you investigate into network issues and try to figure out if there's any security related issues. So we'll go back again. And at the top, you can see that it is currently connected. We can very well change the names of these devices if we know about it by clicking on this button and it would tell us to edit. So I'm going to close this. I can see the device type that it is a Dell Windows 10 laptop. So I'm going to head back. And the other important thing on the home page is that it flashes this uh, alert, right? So it says there's a license problem. So if I click on these and they would show up here. So actually my license for the three years uh, tenure of this uh, MX subscription is expiring in within the next uh, week or two. So it gives me like a warning that I need to uh, renew this license. Otherwise, what would happen is it would not pass data traffic and uh, it would cause a network outage. So I have already reached out to my account representative to get this renewed. So there's a, there's a big red button that shows up on the home screen for you to know that there is some kind of an issue. So that displays right on your home screen. So that was network wired health. If you wanted to, you can actually drill down into the different other networks by uh, clicking on this button, because at the moment we are on the secure wire network. 
If I wanted to change the view of this chart, I can do that by clicking out here and changing the time period. And if I wanted to look at specific clients with some filters, I can very well do that as well. All right. So if I only wanted to uh, view all the access point related clients or switch or MX, I can very well do that as well. We'll be having separate sections just to go through each of these options out here. But this was just to give you like a jump start on what the dashboard looks like, the different look and feel. So network wide configuration can be found right at the top. This would only affect uh, the configuration that you push uh, on irrespective of any device that is connected to this particular network. There's a separate section for security in SD WAN that helps you to identify and configure different settings related to the MX appliance, right? So there are settings for monitoring and configuration. There are settings for wireless as well. And this pertains to your access points. There is a section for the switching, but since we have not really connected the switch, it's not showing up here, which it would do later. And there's also a tab for security manager or SM where it would help us to identify and control all of our mobile devices and roaming clients. And lastly, you have this organization related settings where it helps you to configure settings for all of the network, irrespective where they are, but tied to this particular organization, which is secure wire. All right. So we're going to have that, uh, sections by sections in each lectures, and we're going to see how we can monitor and what we can actually do with the different options in a video from now. So the other thing to note out here is all of these tables that are shown out here, these are called flex tables. And why they're called flex tables is that you can click on this wrench icon and you can select the items that you don't want. So if I don't want to see policy and if I wanted to see, let's say Mac address, I can add that. I can click on first scene. And now I have the columns customized as per my requirements. So these tables everywhere, they're called flex tables, where you can customize the way you want to view information and as per your uh, requirements. All right. Right at the top, there is something called as a search option here, and this is a global search. So if I just look up for, let's say, um, IPS, So it took a partial hit and it gives me some options related to IP assignment, IPsec and VPN. So let's look at if I key in MX, it uh, pulls up my current appliance, some support related articles and community related articles. So this is a very helpful uh, search out here that you can try to look up for issues and also at the same time, look up for configurations and things like that. Now, this was a brief high level overview on what the Meraki dashboard looks like and how you get in. In the next subsequent lectures, we're going to have a deeper dive into each of these sections and we're going to try to see what those each mean and what options each of those have and what they do. Until then, see you in the next one. So to kickstart, we're going to head over to network wide. And at the moment we are on clients, right? So this is the default view that we saw in the last lecture when we actually sign into the Meraki dashboard, we're going to first click on traffic analytics and we're going to try to figure out what it actually does out here. And all of this is monitoring, right? So if you look at the left side, these are all your networking monitoring sections. So at the moment we are under traffic analytics. And this actually gives you some more insight into the different traffic that is flowing across your network. At the top, actually, you can change this view as per the type of devices. For now, we are under security appliances because this is my gateway. If I were to click on access points, I would get the same thing as well. So all of the devices that connected to the access point that generated the traffic is shown up here. 
However, the clients that were connected through an Ethernet cable won't show up here because these are all wireless. So you can actually uh, kind of perform more analytics and try to figure out which client is using most bandwidth, what they were actually doing. So if you look out here, I have, let's pick up some traffic. Let's say um, Instagram out here. So there were like 24.6 megabytes received and 154 kilobytes sent. And you can see the active time, number of clients and things like that. So you can perform deeper level of analytics using this option. You can also drill down the number of SSIDs. So if I'm interested in what uh, the guests actually do on my network, you can very well uh, look at that as well. This way you can investigate potential traffic spikes, anything that uh, resembles out of the ordinary. So out here, I just have uh, less than few clients out, out here, but if you see suddenly a spike at 4 a.m. in the middle of the night, it could mean something uh, malicious going on in your network. So analytics helps you to identify issues like that and also at the same time, make sure your network is healthy. So if I switch back to security appliance, I can see some additional information in here because the data that is actually flowing out here is much more higher. So you can actually drill down into these by clicking on each of this uh, listing application. So if I click on that, it would take me into the actual drill down version of this traffic, right? So application YouTube, but where it was actually going out, you can see the endpoint, the country, protocol, port numbers, and traffic usage. And also at the same time, you can have a look at the clients that were associated to this application. So I have this laptop, which is a Dell Windows 10, and the access point, which shows as an aggregate, right? So many other devices were connected to the access point. So uh, it actually shows that the access point is the requester of that traffic. And once we investigate all of these issues or anything that shows out out of the ordinary, we can uh, investigate and close out your cases. The next option is packet capture. So this is a great feature where you can remotely enable packet capturing on devices, especially when you are having uh, issues in connectivity and things like that. So you can begin by choosing the type of devices from where you want to enable packet capture. So for example, if I want to make sure, so for example, if I want to enable packet capture on my MX firewall, I would just select that, select the firewall that's there in this um, mix. That would be this one. The interface is very important because uh, if you want to capture traffic, you would most likely need to do that on your LAN side because you don't want to do it on the internet side and uh, sniff out traffic on the external facing interfaces. However, if you want to troubleshoot issues related to errors and link flaps, you can certainly do that as well. So once you select the interface, you want to make sure what output you want. PCAP is preferred because we can view this directly in Wireshark and we can define the time interval in seconds out here. We don't want to keep this running for like one day or 24 hours. Verbosity, you can keep high or medium based on the data that you want to see in the packets. And you can very well ignore things like broadcast packets and multicast packets in order to reduce the amount of data captured. And you can also uh, write filter expressions and you can see the examples out here, how you can actually write those expressions and, and only allow uh, packet captures to be associated to specific IP addresses, ports, applications, and different types of services. And you can start packet capture. So if I just say port, Let's say I want to look at, right, look at Telnet. So who is using Telnet on my internal LAN? 
So if I do that, I can just start. And I'm not gonna, and I'm not sure if that's gonna display any packets, but let's give that a minute. If you can see here, the timer has kicked in, so it's 15 seconds now, and I can stop and try to see if it displays me anything. So it directly gave me the Wireshark uh, file. And as you can see, I opened it in Wireshark and it's not showing me anything. Let's look at uh, 443, which it should um, kind of uh, generate a lot of traffic, right? So we can start capture. So let's stop this. All right, there you go. We have this file, so I can directly open it in Wireshark. And they can see I have uh, different data packets show up here using that port 443. All right, so this way you can figure out uh, if there's any issue going on in your network by by enabling packet capture both on your firewalls or uh, on access points or your switches all right moving on to the next one event log now this is a great place to troubleshoot any issues that were actually logged by your meraki devices so right off the bat i have event log ties to the access points so let's look at this uh, real quick so I can see my access point, the timestamp, the SSIDs and the clients that were connected. And I can see the different events, right? So the client was deauthenticated. There was no reason specified. So if there are any uh, collisions on this network, uh, this um, devices are having any issues in authenticating and things like that, you would be able to see this information show up here and you can troubleshoot all these events. You can filter out the different types of events by clicking on these buttons. So let's look at, if you're, if you're only looking at authentication, you would just select this. Let's see, DHCP related issues. You can click on this option. This is especially helpful if your clients complain if they don't receive any IP address, so you can very well choose this. And you can also at the same time, select any other options, right? So if I want radius authentication events, click on that as well. So let's look at uh, all 802.11 association events. And right off the bat, it gave me all these events. So I can use these tabs to navigate to all the events and things like that in drill down into these events all right i can even export this entry into a csv file so that i can open this in excel and do any other uh slicing and dicing of the data similarly i can look at events in the security appliances and over here the logs may be differing so it could be related to uh, Ethernet or DHCP or anything related to that, but there would be overlap between this and access points, but you'd have other information like routing related uh, security events, routing related issues that you can troubleshoot, DHCP, firewall events, right? So events dropped, I can view those as well. All right. So this way I can troubleshoot and figure out if there's any issue going out in my network. So this was event log and how you can leverage this in troubleshooting any issues that you have in your network. And moving on to the last one for the network wide monitoring is map and flow plans where you can get a visual representation of where your access points and the different devices are. So green means that it is good Yellow means it's alerting, offline is red, and dormant is gray in color. Now, 
I don't have any floor plan image attached, but if I wanted to, I can actually do that, right? So when I have access points, I can just say main office, give the address and upload the floor plan that you have as an image file that you may have done in Visio or any other tool, right? You can upload it and add devices based on that. This is especially helpful if you want to have uh, a lot of overview and insight into where your access points are connected and things like that. Especially if you have like hundreds or thousands of access points that you need to keep a track of, right? So this was the end of network wide monitoring review of the dashboard. What are the different options out here located and what you can do with those. In the next video, we're going to have a look at network wide configuration and the different settings that you can uh, play around with that. In this section, we're going to start off with the Miraki MX product line or the security appliance. Before going any further, let us quickly understand why we need security in the first place at any branch offices. Now, if you focus your attention towards the left side out here, I have my branch office out here, right? And typically what happens is a branch office connects to its HQ or headquarters. Let's say it's located out here and you have all your servers like Oracle, SAP, Citrix, data centers out here located, right? So all the DC equipment out here. Normally back in the day, what we used to do is we used to deploy something called as an MPLS, multi-protocol label switching uh, carrier line that is very expensive to connect this branch office to this HQ. Now today what we're doing is we are provisioning broadband internet connections. These are more cheaper, they're more affordable. And also at the same time with the boom of SD-WAN, more and more users want to have direct internet access wherein any internet bound traffic to the public cloud like AWS, Google, Microsoft Azure, all right? It has to go to the public cloud and no longer to your data center. So they need to have direct internet access directly from their branch office to the internet. All right, so out here. Now, most of your point products or security solutions used to be out here at your data centers, like your firewalls, your IPS, right? And now what will happen is when you have direct internet access, all of your traffic is directly going out to the internet and there's no security inspection and control. In order to make sure that you have adequate security at the branch offices, you now need to deploy the same number of firewalls, IPS and other services that you have out here. You need to deploy them out here at your branch location. Malware. All right. Now you can imagine if you have like uh, Cisco FTDs, Palo Alto's, Checkpoint, any other vendor, right? They are expensive. So there's a lot of heavy cost involved. So can you replicate this exact same model out here at the branch location? The answer is no. You need a scalable solution, an affordable solution, which is good enough to handle the branch office traffic to do the same set of inspection, content analysis, everything, and make sure that your direct internet access connections are secure, right? So here comes Meraki MX. It's a very uh, small form factor solution. So you don't need like huge racks and all to uh, rack it up. It's very affordable and it is very scalable. Right. So if you have multiple branch office locations, you can have Meraki MX deployed each, at each of these locations and you can have them connect to the uh, HQ over broadband internet and no longer have expensive circuits like MPLS by building side to side tunnels. Right. So that makes your deployment much more easy. It makes it more secure also at the same time supporting SD-WAN and direct internet access. So uh, when we talked about the cloud boom technology coming up and more and more users are moving to the, to the cloud and there are a lot of new applications coming uh, every single day. 
So irrespective if your business is moving to Microsoft 365, Salesforce, right, SAP in the cloud or any other application workloads uh, in any of the public cloud, you would be always prepared and have everything readily available when they want to move to the cloud, right? So Meraki MX is important and that's the basic role and the most fundamental role that they play at the branch offices. All right. Now, why cannot we have the larger appliances like uh, as I put together out some models out here, these are huge, right? So these are very bulky systems. So in order to run this, you need cooling, you need uh, a colo space, you need proper power, you need backup, right? So it is a lot of overhead to run this and all of that comes at a very high cost. So this is a very important uh, aspect when it comes to larger appliances, like you have your firepower threat defenses, checkpoint firewalls, Palo Alto firewalls, these big UTMs, right? So they're bulky, they're large, and they are a powerhouse unit. They draw a lot of power. So you need something which is compact, which is small enough to fit in your office because uh, you can imagine in your office when you're having people sitting around, you cannot have like a huge FTD that is uh, running throughout the day that's making a lot of noise, right? Drawing a lot of power. So uh, that is one main co uh, constraint when it comes to branch offices. So keep in mind, we are talking about branch offices. Obviously, you need to have these larger appliances at a data center. You cannot have like small uh, Meraki appliances run at your data center processing all the workloads, right? So that's not possible. So the other way around. All right. You need heavy technical expertise to set these up. These are not simple. You have to first uh, get them up through command line, right? And then you have to hook them up on a management dashboard or a management utility. Maybe it's a firepower uh, threat defense. So you need the firepower management center or you need panorama for Palo Alto firewalls. So you need a lot of technical experience and a lot of uh, highly qualified people in order to have them configured. Whereas as compared to Meraki, it's just point and click and zero touch provisioning. For all these larger appliances, you have expensive licenses, right? So these don't come at a cheaper cost. These are very high on maintenance. You have to patch them frequently. You need to monitor them. You need to keep them updated, right? So you don't have any failures and hardware issues or software issues. These come at a very higher OPEX and CAPEX cost. And what I mean by that is if you want to purchase these higher end 5,500 appliances from uh, Cisco FTD line, they come at a very, very high cost. And if you want to renew the licenses on, let's say the FTD, like malware, IPS, content filtering, that also comes at a higher cost. Now that high cost is not justifiable for a branch office, right? However, that high cost is justifiable for a data center, right? So you get my point, right? So uh, since we are only talking about branch offices, this complexity that comes in is only tied to the scope for the branch offices. You have a very high labor cost, wherein you have to ship these devices, you have to send some text to configure these, you need to you know, pay for their lodging, uh, hotels and stuff so also at the same time you need to hire a lot of experienced people in order to manage this or outsource it out to your um, msp or any other provider that would help you to manage them so these come at a higher labor cost also at the same time you need to provide training for the people that are managing it right so this is a brief summary about the complexity that is involved in larger security appliances and why it is not suitable for a branch office. And that's how Meraki comes into play and helps us to solve all of these challenges. And Meraki MX replaces all of these larger security appliances and makes the business more profitable, scalable and more agile. In this lecture, we're going to understand the standard operating procedure in MX deployment, right on your network. Now, MX uh, firewalls are normally deployed at a smaller, larger or a mid-sized 
branch offices right and at hq it is deployed as a vpn concentrator what do i mean by that is this say for example this is my hq your headquarters which is a data center right so i'll note this as dc and you have branch offices 1 2 and 3 right so i'll mark it up branch office 1 branch office 2 and branch office 3 and if you note here i have a smaller footprint of a device like for example mx60 is out here across all the three branch offices i have some servers one or two right at the branch office and users connected on the lan it can also include wireless so at every branch office you would use an mx that is relevant based on the throughput that you want so first is throughput and capacity capacity indicates the number of users that you have right so if you buy and deploy a firewall that supports less number of users and if you have more number of users on the site this would create bottleneck and it will slow down the performance at the same time if you purchase a larger mx appliance and you have only 5 or 10 users you will just waste money so that's the reason why you need to do a proper capacity planning before even doing it and lastly the throughput throughput means if you enable more features on an mx like the way we discussed in the last lecture if you enable thread grid ips amp umbrella each time you enable uh, one set of feature the throughput will decrease so therefore based on a capacity planning you also need to know uh, what are the features that you would be turning on and based on that you would get your effective throughput it could be 100 megabits per second right up to 6 gbps right so uh, very very important things to keep in mind when you are deploying it now this is applicable for your smaller and mid size branch offices so all of these mx devices would connect to your meraki dashboard in the meraki cloud and also at the same time talk to each other when you have vpn enabled and at your hq if you are deploying a meraki mx appliance normally you deploy it as a vpn concentrator wherein it's a passive device and it only partakes in vpn connectivity right so all the traffic originating from this lan this one and the branch office 3 would actually traverse between the mx and the vpn concentrator all right so that's the main reason you need to have uh, a larger appliance at your hq or dc to serve as an mx concentrator or a vpn concentrator and uh this firewall is normally your larger appliance it could be a palo or a cisco ftd it could also be a fortinet a larger 40 gate appliance and you deploy consistent policies across your organization meaning what if you want to enable content filtering out here out here and out here you can deploy it from one single pane of glass from your meraki dashboard normally that this is the architecture and deployment that you use in a typical uh, day to day basis when you have meraki being deployed in your organization now when it comes to communication if the user at branch office 1 want uh, to reach out to the internet the traffic would directly go from this mx60 directly to the internet same thing for branch office 2 and branch office 3 If they want to communicate with devices out here on VLAN one, which is the server VLAN of HQ down here, their traffic would traverse through the MX sixty. It would be encapsulated and encrypted, and it would be routed through this tunnel over the internet to the VPN concentrator and back into this switched network. All right. The same thing would be for branch two and three. So all of the VPN traffic would be tunneled through the site-to-site -site VPN connectivity through the concentrator and through the Meraki cloud. What if they want to communicate with each other? That is, branch office one and branch office two. 
you can enable that communication through the Miraki cloud and that communication will flow from the branch office one it will go to the internet and there will also be a side to side tunnel with the branch office two and that is called a full mesh VPN connections right and that will be also extended to branch office three. So this way you can have all of your branch offices talking to one another and also at the same time with the HQ. The second mode is called hub spoke wherein you have your HQ or your DC as your hub and you have branch offices as spoke. It means that all of the connections and connectivity has to go to your hub and to your branch offices or you can disable them. So ideally full mesh is the way to go in order to have better user experience and better connectivity. Right now I'm on my desk and I have disconnected all my devices and this is how a Meraki MX64 looks like. So this is the top view and right here we have a nice Cisco logo and everything else is just blank. If we flip it, we have an LED indicator that shows up here. If you can focus that. There you go. So the LED indicator provides us with status notifications and what the actual status on the MX is. Out here, there's nothing else. Towards the right side, there's nothing else too. I'll flip to the left side. And out here, there's a, a lock that you can physically attach this device and physically secure into a place, Kensington lock. So uh, you can leverage this as well. If we turn it to the rear side, and before we talk about the ports and stuff, we'll just flip it to the back side. And here's what it looks like. So you have mounting points that you can leverage these to mount it on a wall or on the rack and stuff. So you can very well do that as well. Or you can just place it on a desk just like this. And by connecting the ethernet cables on the rear side, that way you can have this device sitting nicely on a desk. So uh, this is obviously a small form factor. You have larger appliances, bigger than this. So you can mount them on a rack and have them nicely racked up in your closets and stuff. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to flip this over towards the port side. So you have one USB uh, port out here that you can attach a USB device. And we have a total number of five Ethernet ports wherein we can leverage this to connect Ethernet cables and provide uplinks. So this port, which is named as internet on MX64 is your primary uplink van port, right? So in here you connect your uh, ISP provided uh, connections. Ports one, two, three, and four are your LAN ports that you can set up to provide LAN connectivity to different computers. Or you can uh, connect one of these ports to a switch or an access point and you can further extend the connectivity downstream. All right. And moving on, this MX64 also has dual WAN. So this internet, when it is the primary, you can set this up as the port number four. You can set this up as your secondary WAN link. So you can have two WAN interfaces and you can load balance them or you can have them like one on active and the other one in standby. All right, we're going to have a look at this configuration later. Towards the end, you have this reset button where you can um, uh, plug some kind of a pin and you can hold this button and reset it, which we're going to do in a minute. And obviously you have the power connector that you have to use to that you have to use to power this device. So what we'll do here is I'll just keep this down and provide power to this MX. 
bring the key power cord out here and the important thing I need to demonstrate is we're gonna reset this device so I'm gonna flip it to the side so that we can see the LED status notifications and I'm gonna plug in the power cable in here in the power socket once I do that the MX powers on and at the moment it is showing a red LED notification which is bright orange it would slowly blink and it would provide some statuses this LED indicators mean the bright orange or red it means that it is booting up it's not yet loaded up its configuration so we'll just uh, hold on for a minute and as you can see here it is now flashing up different colors right so it's flashing up green violet pink so this means that it is booting up and towards the end of the state we want to see a bright green light followed by a white light that means that it is successfully connected to the dashboard so I already have an old configuration on this so it would actually um, load up a white light which would actually mean that it would connect to the dashboard so we'll just give that a minute and in order to have connectivity to the dashboard we need to plug in the van interface right so I'm gonna plug in the van interface and just show you uh, what that actually looks like I'm gonna take my van cable and plug it in the van port and let's see the status notification and there you can see it is flashing again uh, different colors and we'll try and see if it successfully connects to the cloud And there you go uh, at the moment we are actually seeing this as a, a steady white light so the LED is no longer flashing and it's no longer showing those rainbow colors and if I can flip it up and you can see that it is a steady white LED that we want this means that the MX has successfully connected to the Meraki cloud dashboard and it is passing data traffic all right what we're gonna do next is I'm gonna reset this device so that it is brand new restored to its factory settings and then we can configure this device right from scratch in this lecture we're gonna kickstart and configure our MX64 security appliance so let's get right into the process we have linked our security appliance to our network which is secure wire corp office right so we're gonna only see that tab in that particular network if we go into our other network which is secure wire sales office we would not be able to see that device right because we have added that device into the corp office network so under this we only see our switch configuration and security appliance is not there so we're gonna head back to our corp office to kickstart our MX configuration now note that it already passes traffic so you don't have to do anything but at the moment we need to secure our MX device configure it as per our standards so we need to go into security in SD van and first of all click on appliance status to make sure we see our appliance and configure the initial uh, statuses and initial configuration so let's give that a minute to load up all right it has now loaded up the very first thing that you can check out here is the port status so I have the port 1 connected port 4 that is connected to my secondary van and the internet port is also connected to my van interface the very first step that I like to do is if you see up here you see the MAC address as the name of the MX64 appliance. 
So what I can do is I can click on this pencil icon to edit and I'd like to give it a nice name. And I say secure wire corp MX and click on save. So that should give it a nice name. So next time when I see this um, device on the dashboard, it can give me nice user friendly name. So I can see the network usage out here, both for the uh, van number one and van two. We already saw this configuration in the physical overview when we actually set this up. Next, I can click on this address and I can provide some uh, address information. I can name the city and the country and hit on save. All right. And I can very well uh, move this device in a different location just to make sure I have this accurately marked on the map that it is located at. So I can very well do that as well. So I'll leave this at default. Warm spare, we're going to look at this in later video, but you can set up multiple devices and as hot standby. So if MX, if my primary MX, which is this one fails, the secondary warm spare device would take over. So we're going to have a look at this later. And down here, I see my primary van interface, which is this one, right? So it shows me this IP address and it says that this is active. My secondary van is ready. That means at a time, my primary van interface would take control of all the data traffic. And this one would be standby. If this fails, the secondary van would take over. All right. And you see this host name down here, right? So this can be a dynamic host name where you can use this to connect to this MX from outside the internet. If you wanted to, you can change this. All right. I'll leave this as default and hit cancel. You can see the serial number, right? And down here you have the tags and notes. So network tags, we're going to look at in more details later. So notes, I can write a note saying that default gateway for corp office. and save that it shows you that the firmware is up to date and here it shows you the current version of the mx firmware we're gonna update firmwares in the uh, later videos from now and towards the end it shows you configuration and the status is out of con out of date so we changed some configuration and it would take some minutes for it to sync up so the MX periodically checks in with the dashboard. So it may take a minute or two to sync up the new configuration as we added some minor details here. Towards the end, you have this option to remove this appliance from the network. So if you wanted to decommission this or move it to a different location or a different network. So that's the time you use this button to remove this MX from this network and configure it somewhere else. So we'll go up here and under summary, there's a, a button called uplink. So we're going to click on that. And in here, I can see that my primary van interface is having this IP address right on the van side. And this is the public IP address, which is natted out by the ISP. So we saw this configuration in the initial video. So if I wanted to, I can edit this and I can uh, and I can add the new IP config, which is provided by my ISP, which we are not going to change at the moment. So we'll hit cancel. And also at the same time, I have my van two, which is the secondary van that is ready to go if this one fails. All right. So this is the IP address that it pulled up through DHCP when we set this up for PPPoE. And I have this option to connect this van port back to a LAN port 
if I no longer need a secondary van. All right. So if you move down here, I can see the status of the van. And since the secondary van is on standby, it is showing as zero while the other one is active. Down here, you can also see the latency, right? In milliseconds, both uh, vans, like van one and van two. And this actually shows you which uh, van link is having any high latency. You can move the traffic back to the other one. So intelligently, you can set up uh, those uh, policies that we're going to do that in later videos. Also, you can see uh, if you have any packet losses on the link that you can try to figure out if there is any issues, you can troubleshoot that and get real time statuses. The way that it does that is the Meraki MX actually syncs up to 8.8.8.8 .8 to kind of ping that and try to figure out if there's any latency. If we wanted to, we can change this. So we're going to have a look at that when we actually set up the other artifacts in organization and network. So you also have a DHCP option here to see DHCP lease and DHCP subnets. So we're going to do this in the later video. You can also set up the network location of this device so that you can easily pinpoint where this Meraki MX is located. So it's easier for your other administrators to kind of uh, locate where your uh, devices or office locations are present. At the end, you have this tools button where you can uh, do some troubleshooting steps and you can kind of figure out if there's any issues with your network. You can obviously reboot this appliance by clicking on this button rather than visiting a site. If you click on this button to blink LEDs, the entire MX would just light up green in color and run a throughput test, a trace route test, and an MTR test, DNS lookup, and try to see if uh, there's any issues and things like that. So this was the initial part of the config. In the next video, we'll jump into the additional configuration like IP addressing and VLANs. Until then, see you in the next one. We're going to continue off from where we left off. So we're going to jumpstart our other configuration related to our MX security appliance. And in order to do that, we'll navigate to security and SD van under secure wire corp office where our MX is located and we're going to click on addressing and VLANs. The first step is to make sure that this MX is in routed mode and not through the pass through or VPN concentrator mode because this is our default gateway and it functions at layer three to route network traffic. So most of the times uh, I've seen that MXs are used in routed mode where they are deployed, typically at corporate offices or branch offices, sales offices in any other location. The reason you will always use pass through or VPN concentrator is if you have another next generation firewall like an FTD or a Palo Alto device and you would only use MX devices to form VPN tunnels between your sales offices or any other locations. Right? So this is very rarely used as a VPN concentrator or a pass through and most likely it is used as a routed mode because it exchanges network routes and functions at a layer three. Right? So we keep, so we're going to keep this as a routed firewall and move down. Client tracking would be based on MAC address, which is the default. So uh, we'll leave that as default. And down here, if you have multiple VLANs at an office, you can very well do that, right? So normally it's best practice to split up uh, your single network into multiple VLANs so that you have better security, right? So if there's a malware propagation on one of the network, it doesn't affect the other devices connected on your LAN. So if you have like sensitive equipment like servers and high, uh, and highly confidential information, you have to put that on a secure VLAN and segregate that information out. So we're going to do that in here. 
So I'll click on VLANs. So this is the default VLAN, right? Which is 192.168.128.0 slash 24. I'm going to click on add VLAN and let's say, so secure network and I'm going to say this VLAN number is 10 group policy. I'm going to keep none because we're going to visit uh, group policies later when we talk about group policies. And I'm going to assign the MX IP address as 192.168.0.254, which is my gateway. And the subnet is going to be 192.168.0.0/24. So this is my secure network. And I'm going to hit create to create this network. All right. So I'll create another one for my unsecure network. So let's call that unsecure guest. All right. And I'm going to call this VLAN number 20. So let's put the IP address for this one to be 192.168.1.0. Sorry, 1.0. 254 and the network would be 192.168.1.0 slash 24 to summarize i have a secure network which is on 192.168.00 slash 24 and an unsecured network which is guest network which is on 192.168.1.0 slash 24 so we'll keep it simple just to make sure we are on the same page. And if you wanted to, you can delete this, but I'll keep that uh, intact because it is having a VLAN of number one, which is native VLAN. So we'll keep it at that. And port settings. Now, this is very interesting. If you have specific VLANs that you want to tag to a different port on the MX, you can do that. So let's review some of the port settings and we'll go out here and click on this port number one and edit. And let's say I want to put this in an access mode rather than a trunk port where a trunk always allows all of the VLANs, right? So I'm going to put this in access mode and I'm going to tag this in a secure network. All right. Access policies we'll talk about later. So I'm going to keep this open and update and as you can see out here i vlan has been changed and the port has now been in access mode number two and three ports on the mx device let's keep them in trunk and let's check the settings out here so this is trunk it's enabled and native vlan is one which is default so we don't have to delete that and I'm going to all, I'm going to allow all the VLANs on this port, right? So this could be connected to a switch. So I'm going to keep that provision. All right. And if we have any static routes, we can very well put them out here. All right. So at the moment I don't. So if you had any routes that you had to specify to get to a next address, we can do that. Uh, we're going to skip uh, source space routing, warm spare and dynamic DNS. And we're going to have a look at this later. So this is our initial settings. So what we're going to do here is click on save to save our settings. Now our changes are saved. So that covers the VLAN part and the routing part. So we need to make sure we have DHCP set up on these IP addresses so that I can assign IP addresses to my other devices. So to take care of the DHCP settings, what we're going to do here is come to security in SDVAN and click on DHCP. All right. So if you can see out here for each specific VLAN, we have a DHCP setting. So let's review our VLAN 1. Now for VLAN 1, 
which is our native VLAN, uh, we have an option out here if we want to run a DHCP server or not. So what I can do is I can say that do not respond to DHCP requests on VLAN 1. On VLAN 10, I can say that run a DHCP server on the secure network so that it can provide DHCP assigned IP addresses to the clients that connect to my VLAN 10, which is secure network. So these could be laptops or devices connecting wirelessly uh, on this particular network. And I can run a DHCP server, so I'll leave it at that. Lease time is 24 hours and DNS name servers would be to proxy up the upstream DNS servers that are provided by the that are provided by the MX device and we'll keep the boot options disabled. All right. If we wanted to add some DHCP options which are provided for the VoIP phones and stuff, we can provide those, right? So NTP servers, MTUs, TFTP server names and stuff like that. So I'll skip this and cancel it out. If I wanted to reserve some addresses, I can do that as well. So we're going to keep this default and move to the next one. And for VLAN 20, which is my unsecure network, which is for the guests, I can run a DHCP server as well because I would need our guests to have IP addresses. So I'll go ahead and save the changes. And there you go, the changes for DHCP server are set up. Now this, you cannot edit out here because we have to edit that in the addressing and the VLAN settings, right? So this you can only define, so in this you can only define DHCP related settings, all right? So network related settings, you have to perform them out here. All right, so that completes our initial setup for the first part of the configuration of the MX. In the next part, we're going to talk about firewalls, security related settings and application related settings. Until then, see you in the next one. In this section, we're going to talk about Cisco Meraki MR or access point wireless access points. So I'll just make a note of MR that we're talking about. So this product line from Cisco Meraki is associated to your wireless access points that extends your physical local area network into a wireless network. Before jumping into the actual MR products, how they work, different models and things associated with them. So let's take a step back and really understand and do a quick recap on what wireless networks are and the standards associated with them. All right. So I'm pretty sure you might have heard of this term called Wi-Fi, right? So Wi-Fi essentially stands for wireless fidelity and it is actually a measure of how accurate the signal is. So when you say signal, so you have your access point, which is a wireless device that transmits wireless signals in the airspace. And if you are closer to this access point, maybe in this range out here, you'll receive greater strength of signal. If you are farther away, the signal strength would uh, decay and you'll receive a poor signal. So Wi-Fi essentially measures the signals strength that the receivers receive. And obviously this access point is tied to my switch down here. And this is again connected to your router maybe and then connects to your internet. All right. So without any physical cables, you receive this wireless signal. Now, essentially, if you wanted to connect to this network, you would have to physically plug in your Ethernet cable right to the LAN. So you need to have a physical access to this uh, device. And even if you have a physical access, you'd later need to authenticate maybe through 802.1x protocol, right? Maybe you have Cisco ICE or anything related to network access control. Similar to that, for joining your wireless network, you have something called as access control. All right. 
So essentially access control is defined through multiple standards. So you can have multiple protocols and different standards that you can use to deploy access controls on your wireless networks. Now, the very first one is WEP, which is a very old protocol or an old standard. And it is proven that it is having poor security and it is highly vulnerable and it can be cracked in minutes. We'll not go into the deep weeds on how web works, what it is. So you need to authenticate these users and make sure you know who they are before even connecting to this network. And web uses a passphrase that each of the clients that connect to the wireless network need to enter every time they connect to this wireless network. And web implements the encryption and implementation of the access control through this passphrase. Those algorithms are vulnerable and that's why it has a poor security. We'll not go into the technical details because it's out of scope from this course, right? So if you want to learn more about this, there's plenty of stuff on Wikipedia or YouTube uh, if you want to understand more details around this. Next came WPA, right? Wi-Fi protected access. Now, this was a temporary enhancement over web, which was easy to break. But over the period of time, when computation power increased, this was also vulnerable and breakable. Then came WPA2 which is still used as of day today and it produces good to medium security all right so this is often coupled with psk which is pre-shared key just like your passphrase and eep which has a suite of different implementations like certificates all right so this is still used in enterprises and widely adopted in various deployments for wireless infrastructure and till date WPA2 is used and it provides good security. But this protocol or this standard also comes with its own vulnerabilities and it is also not highly secured. And that's the reason why we have WPA3 which is pretty latest as of 2020. All right. And this protocol was introduced to overcome some of the weaknesses on WPA2. And this is the latest and greatest wireless access control protocol or a standard that is used. Now this provides absolute forward secrecy and it has many other features that are greater than what WPA2 provides. And it is actually not widely used at the moment, but uh, networks are being transitioned actively. Now, if you look down out here, you have a section of the wireless standards as per the IEEE. You need to know about these because we'll be discussing heavily around when we talk about Miraki MR implementation of the wireless signals and stuff, you'll need to know and you'll often see these show up. So 802.11a is associated to Wi-Fi 2, which was somewhere released in 1999. And the way and the frequency on this protocol works is on 5 gigahertz only, which is the wireless signal. All right. So it doesn't support 2.4, which is the standard. So B G support 2.4 gigahertz as a standard. And as you can see, 5 gigahertz provides you with higher speeds, whereas the B1 provides you with 11 megabits per second. And these are pretty old protocols. And then came uh, 802.11n. And this is associated to Wi-Fi 4. It was released somewhere in 2009. That provides you with up to 100 megabits per second. And it operates on both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. So this was actually used as a standard uh, throughout the organization deployment because it both supports legacy devices and new devices and it provided you with higher throughput. 802.11ac is relatively new when it came out in 2014 which provides you with up to 1 Gbps of speed and it only works on 5 GHz. 
So if you have any devices that only support 2.4 gigahertz band, you would not be able to have them supported on 802.11 AC. For that, you need to jump into 802.11 AX, which is based on Wi-Fi 6. And we'll just talk about what Wi-Fi 6 is. And this is very, very new. And as you can see, it provides you with a speed of relatively around 14 gigabits per second, which is pretty blazingly fast. And it works on both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz frequency spectrum. We will not dive into each of these standards uh, to know about how they work, how they were implemented and what they are. But this is just to give you an overview and a recap on wireless networks and standards before we jump into the Cisco Meraki MR implementation. All right. So the important piece to know out here is WPA3 all right, and Wi-Fi 6 which we're going to briefly touch base in a minute. All right, so WPA3, as we talked about, it's a standard and Wi-Fi 6 is the sixth generation of Wi-Fi implementation. So here are some features of WPA3 and what you need to know about it. Normally at the moment, we, we extensively have used WPA2, whether if it's home, or offices WPA3 is relatively new somewhere in 2019 it came out right so folks are moving from WPA2 to WPA3 in order to have better security and better connectivity experience the very first thing is connect devices without displays to network through phones etc now what this means is say for example Today, we are moving into something called as IoT deployments, right? Internet of things. You have thermostats, you have temperature sensors and things like that. They need to have Wi-Fi access. But if you have noticed, thermostats and temperature sensors normally don't have a display, right? So how would you connect them to your Wi-Fi or wireless network? So in WPA3, you can natively connect them through a phone or any other device that helps them to relay that wireless signal. So WPA3 has that native feature built in to support IoT devices. Now in WPA3, even if you have an open network, wherein open means you don't have any uh, authentication, right? You don't have any access control. So anybody can join in on an open network. So data encryption is natively supported in that. However, in WPA2, if you have open network, it is not encrypted. So if I have an open network out here and I join in here and somebody else joins it as well uh, at a distance apart, whatever traffic I'm sending to this network is unencrypted. So this person can sniff out on this media and kind of understand the type of traffic, what I'm sending over this network, right? So it's not encrypted. However, in WPA3, it is na natively encrypted by default. It also natively prevents you from brute force attacks, whereas WPA2 doesn't prevent you from brute force attacks. Brute force essentially means that this guy, if it's a, a malicious user, he will try password one, password two, password three, and all of the dictionary based attacks against your network to guess a password and to try different combinations. So that's brute force. In WPA3, it is natively baked into the security stack of the WPA3 to prevent brute force attacks. So this was a brief overview and features of WPA3, what they are. When you come down to Wi-Fi 6, base standard which is the sixth generation it uses orthogonal fdma which is frequency division multiple access and with this type of a deployment it increases your network capacity and that's the reason why you get higher speeds right and better delay and contention resolutions and it is very very good for wipe and time-based apps so things like your video conferencing right group calling 
So it is very, very good for these type of applications. It uses the implementation of MUMIO wherein it you can support multiple antennas to form radio signals into beacons and you can have simultaneously broadcasting, receiving and transmitting of information. So this also contributes to its higher throughput and it has less interference and higher capacity. So it's 40% faster than Wi-Fi 5, which is the previous generation. And it is also good on power saving. So if you have any smartphones that are connected to a Wi-Fi 6 enabled wireless deployment, if you don't have any signals coming out from that phone or a Wi-Fi device, the radio transmitter or a receiver on this device, it put into a sleep state so that it consumes less battery and provides a better experience. Now let's talk about some of the features that are built into your Meraki MR access points. So the greatest and the biggest one is BYOD and guest access policies. So this is baked into your Meraki MR access points. Typically, your older access points like Cisco APs, um, to provision guest access and things like that, you would need to have something called as ICE or Identity Services Engine and external other platforms. So all of these features for segregation, your device control, everything is supported natively through your Cisco Meraki MR access point. You can apply traffic shaping rules that supports your SD-WAN based deployment. You can have uh, tagging for different applications. Like if you have, let's say Office 365, you can give this highest priority and if you have YouTube, you can give this application lower priority, right? So this is especially useful if you don't have uh, a content filtering device like a next generation firewall in your sales office. And if you have only an access point and a router that routes traffic, you can implement all of those rules on your Meraki MR access points directly. You have the features of enterprise level security that supports things like radius, right? direct active directory integration, right? So if you don't want to have pre-shared key based implementation, you can have user level authentication directly with uh, Microsoft Active Directory or LDAP, Radius, certificate based authentication and things like that. So enterprise level security is supported natively. It also has WIDS and WIPS, which is a wireless intrusion detection and wireless intrusion prevention system. And this is powered through Sourcefire or Snort. So it has Snort rules built into this. And you can monitor your network traffic and detect potential intrusions and drop them, right? Which is pretty cool. You can directly do it on access points now. Earlier, you would need to have like a physical device, like an IPS or a firewall to do that. But now you have that feature directly available to you on your MR access point. You have the feature for location analytics, wherein it would gather all the details and information from your devices and clients connecting and based on different locations, it would provide you insights, right? And this would be useful information that would help you to make some informed decision, implement some proactive controls, like if a particular location has higher number of DHCP failures, a higher number of contention ratios, right so you can use and gain that information through location analytics obviously wireless health which helps you to provide a dashboard which generates a lot of events and show you if there are any health related issues wherein clients are failing to connect they're failing to get ip addresses what could be the potential issue things like that can be traced through wireless health MR wireless access points directly integrate to Cisco umbrella, which is a DNS layer protection feature or security at the DNS layer. And this is pretty cool. And if you wanted to integrate this with Cisco umbrella, it is directly supported. All you need to do is just key in the API keys and you're done, All right? So that is pretty cool feature of your MR access point. 
The other great feature about this is IPSK. All right. And IPSK is nothing but identity pre-shared key. All right. Now, pre-shared key is something like uh, a key that a client uses to authenticate to your wireless network and they would be allowed to join. Miraki MR implements an algorithm wherein there is one set of keys for one specific set of devices wherein a user would be able to use multiple keys in order to join a network and they'll be able to uh, be segregated and apply access control based on the keys they type in. Before we dive into IPSK, let's quickly understand PSK and how that works. So let's say I have my access point out here. Ignore whatever is there on your left side and focus only on this part which is at the bottom. So this wireless access point is beaconing wireless signals, right? And let's say I implement PSK through WPA2. If I have a client out here, right? And they're using an iPhone to connect to this access point. So PSK or pre-shared key would be like a passphrase, right? So you type in the passphrase or you provide that passphrase to the user. They type in on the device and they get authenticated and they connect to this network. Let's say my other colleague needs to join this network. All they need to do is again, type in the same passphrase and they'll be able to join in. Now we use the same passphrase, which is identical or same, right? And we join this network, pretty simple and pretty straightforward. What Miraki does with IPSK is that this PSK, this key for me, I append Y, right? So this is different from this one, all right? If I type in this key and join to this network, I get a set of access control, let's say AC1. And if the other types in a different key, which is provided to them, they get a set of access controls, which are different from me, correct? So this could be things like, I can only access servers when I type in this key. If I type in this key and join the network, I don't get to access the servers. So using pre-shared keys by segregating them, I can have various access control policies applied to them, right? And I don't need to do any changes out here when it comes to SSIDs. Normally back in the day, what we used to do is we would create a separate SSID for this person and we'll create a separate SSID for this person, X and Y. And let's call this guest and this to be employee. So when users join the employee SSID, they get a separate access control. When the guests join uh, SSID Y, they get a separate access control. This was a little tedious to maintain, right? So you end up in having like five, six SSIDs, which create a lot of interference and other issues. So with IPSK or identity pre-shared key, you provide an identity based access control by having only one SSID. So this was P PSK, right? So with IPSK, let's say I have three segregation made, like bring your own device. I have my sensors and I have my guests. Now this could be my trusted network or trusted access, right? For guest, this is untrusted. And for BYOD are devices that are again, untrusted. Now what I can do is using the same access point, using one single SSID, which is SSID A, I can have three pre-shared keys, which are different from one another. I can provide all those pre-shared keys, PSK to my guests. PSK two is set up on your sensors, like thermostats, temperature regulators, HVACs and things like that. And I can provide PSK one to all the BYOD users. Now with that, I don't, I don't have to maintain multiple SSIDs. So this eliminates the uh, headache of having multiple SSIDs and configuration issues. And with that, I can assign 
policies based on pre-shared keys. I no longer need Radius servers, LDAP servers to enforce identity level access control. I have a single SSID for multiple use cases, which uh, decreases my overhead in maintenance and administration. And obviously I can apply multiple group policies based on your pre-shared keys. We're going to have a look at IPSK implementation later down in the videos, but I wanted to highlight this first because this is one of the most coolest features that MR pro, uh, that Cisco uh, Meraki MR access points provides with eliminating multiple infrastructure elements like Active Directory, Radius, and directly providing you with identity-based access control. Now, in order to run IPSK, your Meraki MR APs should be having the firmware version MR27.1 and above. So this is the only prerequisite that is required. The next coolest feature is local authentication. Now what local authentication does is it helps you to completely remove things like radius based deployments that we used to do in the past. For example, let's say I have this client and I have this Meraki MR access point. Back in the day, what we used to do is we used to set up a radius server outside here. And this would be connected to your access point. If you wanted to implement things like Active Directory based integration, you had to have a radius server mandatory deployed, right? So without the radius server, you would not be able to uh, perform Active Directory authentication and authorization uh, with any of your access points. Now with Meraki MR, what happens is this completely removes all your radius level requirements and you can have direct integration with local authentication. So what happens out here is that your Meraki MR access point has the functionality to translate radius exchange messages into direct LDAP exchange messages. So by completely eliminating your radius services, it can directly talk to your LDAP or Microsoft Active Directory, right? So you can implement all of that enterprise level security without the need of an radius server. That includes certificate level based authentication and authorization, right? So that is pretty seamlessly supported out of the box through your MR directly. Now what happens if your AD server or an LDAP server dies out? So if this link fails, right? If this links fail, the entries that were previously handled were cached and stored it locally on your Meraki MR access point out here. And all of the future requests and authorization from the same users will be locally authenticated through its cache. So you don't need to have this uh, LDAP server online all the time, correct? So that decreases your time and latency. So it provides faster access. It supports all of your enterprise level connectivity protocols that is EAP TLS certificate based, EAP TTLS and EAP GTC. And it also has a support for certificate revocation or CRLs to uh, support devices that have expired certificates and things like that. All right. And in order to have this local authentication support, you need to have Meraki MR version 27.1 and above for your Meraki access points. So to quickly recap, we talked about all of the features of the MR access point and I took a step back and added local authentication and IPSK features, which is, uh, which is great. And it helps the Meraki MR access point to stand out from the competition, right? So that's the reason why I included this and we'll be having a look at how to set these up in the later videos. So see you then. In this lecture, we're going to talk about the physical appearance of a Meraki MR 33 access point that we have at the moment here. And actually we have this powered on and if you can see the status LED uh, steady green, that means it is ready for config and ready for connection. It is not connected to the Meraki dashboard. All right. So over the top, we have this inbuilt antenna, which is there inside this AP because we have 
an indoor AP. Uh, there are no external antennas anywhere. If we look towards the side, there's nothing out here. And this side as well. On this side, we have a Kensington lock that you can utilize this AP and connect this securely to a physical location. Towards the rear side, there's nothing else. Uh, so we're gonna flip this over. So at the back, you have these mounting points that you can utilize and attach the mounting bracket and attach it on a wall or a ceiling so that you can have better coverage. Or you can have this sitting on the desk, uh, but you may have some poor coverage issues. If we look out here, we have the Meraki branding. And so I'll remove this cable so that you can have a look at that. So we have the power specification, the model number, which is out here. Uh, the serial numbers and the FCC regulation information and the serial number is located down here and obviously we have the power uh, connector that we can use to connect All right and if I lift it up you can see that there's a Ethernet connector that you can use to connect this uh, access point to a switch or in my case, I'm directly connecting it to my MX appliance. And there's a small uh, insertion out here that is actually used to reset this configuration of this Meraki device. That we're gonna do that uh, a minute from now. Alternatively, if you don't wanna use this power connector, you can very well use this ethernet cable as a PoE port as mentioned down here. All access points may not support PoE, but this MR33 that I have at the moment supports PoE. So what I can do is, so in places where you have wall sockets where power connections are not available, you can use PoE and you can have um, only one cable that is Ethernet cable running to this. So what we're going to do next is, we're going to plug the power connector in here. We're going to use this Ethernet cable to connect this into the socket. And the LED starts blinking. And we're going to take a pin. And what we're going to do here is I'm going to reset whatever configuration was there out here. So I'm going to push this and hit and keep it steady for like 5 to 10 seconds. So as you can see the LED status starts blinking. Right, so I'm going to release that and flip it over. And now the status LED from green, it has now turned into steady amber or orange. It's going to cycle through the boot process just like how we saw for the Meraki MX. And we're going to have a look at that in a minute. Alright, and there you go. It is now a flashing rainbow colors. As you can see, it's going pink, green, blue, violet. So we're going to wait until it's turned steady green which means that it has fully loaded up its factory settings and we're going to head back over to our workstation and set up the remaining portion of this configuration. Alright there you go. The status is now uh, steady green which means that it has booted up properly. And now that we have seen the physical specifications of the Meraki MR33 access point you also get this plate cover that you can affix this access point and wall mount this equipment that would help you to kind of firmly get the equipment uh, steadily put together. And this particular mount is for the MR33 and you get this nice water leveler 
that can help you to kind of gauge the alignment and make sure it is properly aligned and you can use any of these screw points to wall mount this plate and what you're going to do is along with these two insertion points align them securely to these plate options so i'll flip it over and securely press them so flip it this side and push it again so now you have this access point securely fastened along with the base plate and before putting this together you need to make sure that it is first mounted to the wall so this base plate should be mounted to the wall first before hooking up the access point to the plate and make sure you use this water leveler to ensure that it is aligned perfectly uh, fine with the wall so that you know aesthetically it is very pleasing to unfasten it you just need to press on this hinge and it will come right off there you go so what i've done is i went into my mx out here and as you can see the vlans so i have two vlans vlan 10 and vlan 20 vlan 10 is secure network and this is my native vlan and this subnet is 192.168.0.0 slash 24 all right the second one is unsecure guest which is vlan 20 that is 192.168.1.0 we're gonna make use of this later when we are actually having guests and uh, isolated networks so what i'll do here is i'll set up this port that is port 1 a strong port all right and this is enabled and native vlan is 10 all right we have an option to drop untagged traffic but we're not going to do that all our allowed vlans is everything right so i'm going to update this there's no change but this port which is port number one on the mx is connected to my access point right so that's the ethernet that these are connected to so it's already passing some traffic and i can see it on the dashboard and we already added the access point and it's under our secure wire corp office so to access the access point and perform some initial configuration what we're going to do next is hop onto wireless configure and sorry we'll hop on to wireless monitor access point and once that loads up we can see here that our access point is online all right and we can see it out here and it is named based on its mac address we can see its connectivity status where it went down from 11 pm to roughly about 9 am and the model number we can see it's mr33 if we wanted to add some more details here we can certainly do that like for example public ip usage and let's say firmware version if you wanted to see that detail we can certainly add that too and we already talked about this being a flex table so in the first part of the lectures now as a first step you have a couple of options what we're going to do here is change the name so i'm going to click on this name Now, obviously, first of all, I need to change this name. So I'm going to say secure wire AP. And it's called the zero one. And hit save. And I can set like a location and say, so I'm just going to call this address as Mumbai, India, where it's located at. We can put other details right and we'll look at ssids later but as you can see you can see the you can view the live uplink data the current connected clients all right so let's expand this you can see 
um, a couple of laptops in an Android phone. We'll look at this later, but we'll set up the main parameters out here. You already have the LAN IP assigned statically through the local pages. If you did not have the chance to do that, you can certainly do out here. The DNS information is directly pulled from the MX and you can see here that it's directly connected to the MX appliance and it's a one gigabit connection, full duplex, right? There's no IPv6 at the moment, serial number and tags we're gonna look at later, but I'll just put a note saying that, let's say located at boardroom, ground floor, this basically helps you to kind of identify where the access points are located and put like short notes. Firmware is up to date, right? So it's running as of now 27.6. Configuration is out of change because we made some minor changes. So it's gonna pull that in a couple of minutes. So all this looks fine. All right, so if you wanted to view the event log, we can certainly do that out here uh, to view the access point event log and what's happening behind the scenes out here. And let's location we can set, but for now I've disabled it. And connections, this we're gonna uh, look at in more details later and how this can help you to troubleshoot. And obviously we have performance. This may help you to troubleshoot again issues and signal quality uh, issues that may be reported. We have a couple of tools out here to run some troubleshooting steps. If you want to blink the LEDs, we can certainly click on this button and the LEDs on the access point will blink. This may be especially helpful for remote troubleshooting and things like that. All right, so that looks good. And I think we are good for the next set of configuration and dive deeper into these access point settings and things. So stay tuned for the next video. In the last video, we saw some basic configuration of the access point for Meraki MR. In this video, we're going to deep dive into SSIDs, setting up SSIDs, which are the fundamental elements of any access point and diving deeper into the other configuration items. So to kickstart with the SSID setup, what we do is we come into the specific network, which is secure via corp office, hop on to wireless under configure, click on SSIDs. Now we have not actually done anything out here, but when we reset our AP or access point, when it linked to the dashboard, it actually pulls up the name of the network, which is secure via corp office, right? As you can see, dash wireless as the default SSID name for the first SSID. All right. And that is enabled. And the other issue, and the other part of this is that it is open, right? So anybody on this network can see this uh, SSID being broadcast and they can join this network. Now this is the default behavior of the Meraki MR access point, all right? To show the default network name followed by dash wireless. To fix this, what we need to do is first edit this setting, all right? And change this from open to WPA2 or WPA3. You don't want to have unauthenticated users use your uh, connectivity or carry out any malicious operations. All right. So what we'll do here is we're going to create two SSIDs, one for the office people. So I can have my office staff like users from sales, marketing, HR, IT, they can connect to that securely. And I can have another one created just for the guests that are my external users that would be able to connect it and have like a segregated network. So we're going to do exactly that. So what we're going to do here is first click on rename to rename this SSID, right? And I'm going to call this secure wire office only rather than calling it corp and drop the other keywords. Secure wire office, right? That looks good. Hit save changes. All right, so once that is in place, we're gonna hop on to our access control and just for security reasons, we will just lock this down first 
and we're going to talk about access control in a full blown uh, different lectures. All right. So for now, just to secure my SSID, what I'll do here is click on pre shared key and enter a password and go ahead and save just to make sure I don't have any malicious users joining my network and uh, creating any havoc. All right, so once this is in place, we'll go back to wireless SSIDs. As you can see here, it is now called SecureWire Office with encryption PSK, WPA1 and WPA2. I know that you would be saying, why would I use this? But this is just temporary. So we're going to jump into access control later in which uh, period we'll be having a deeper dive into the actual configuration and setup. Now let's create another SSID and call that secure wire guest. All right. So we'll take this one and set it up as guest. It's disabled at the moment. So we're going to drop this down and click on enable to uh, enable it. We're going to click on rename to change this name to secure wire guest. All right, so that should do it. Click on save changes to make sure it is committed. So this is now active, right? And these are grayed out. So we'll go ahead and secure this as well temporarily because I don't want any unauthorized use. So at the moment we are targeting secure wire guest, right? So if you wanted to, you can just click on this drop down and select the other SSID, correct? So we'll go ahead and stick with secure wire guest. And for now, I'm just going to put a pre-shared key. Head right down or click on this button to save. And that should do it. And I'm going to come back to my SSIDs. As you can see here, I have nice, clean SSID secure wire office, which is my primary secure SSID. And the second one, I have a secure wire guest SSID for all my guests from outside the office or organization. We're going to jump into some access control later, but just to wrap up some of the SSID related stuff in total, you can configure up to 15 SSIDs on this Meraki MR33 access point. So if you click on this button, You'd be able to see all your SSIDs. Now, I would highly recommend to keep this uh, to a bare minimum. So less is always better. Or we have a saying called less is more. Don't try to have more than three SSIDs because I don't, I don't feel, I don't think it's ever required to have more SSIDs based on the security or segregation that you want to have. But Meraki has some cool features that you can segregate within this single SSID, have like different connections for, let's say your, uh, your office people, whether they are IT, HR, finance, marketing, you can apply different policies based on a single SSID rather than to create separate SSIDs. Because back in the day, what we used to do is we used to have one guest, one secure office SSID, one office for like wireless guns or barcode readers that would be having uh, the native or very old encryption techniques or alg algorithms. And even just to have support for other devices, we would create separate SSIDs, but you no longer have to do that. And I prefer to have just two, that is one for secure and one for unsecure. And we're going to talk about how we can further divide this uh, based on policies and access control, where we would be talking about multiple job related functions and apply policies based on that. So all these SSID settings look to be fine with me out here. And that brings us to the end of this current video on SSIDs. In the next video, we're going to talk about encryption, access control, and the different techniques, how you can lock down wireless users. In this section, we're going to talk about Meraki MS or Meraki switches. To kickstart this module, 
we're gonna go over some of the brief features we're gonna look at the various models of the Meraki MS switches that are available as of December 2021 and we're gonna dive into some of the unique features about the switching elements that is related to your Meraki switches and we're gonna also have a look at how they differ with the other switches that are provided by other vendors like Ubiquiti and Aruba and the other vendors. All right. So to jumpstart, we've already seen this for Meraki MX, uh, the MR, right? So you have a central cloud-based management. So all of the switches that you deploy for Meraki in your organization can be centrally managed through the cloud. So you don't need to have any SSH into this individual switch. You can directly access it through the cloud through the HTTPS protocol, which is a web UI. And there's no such thing as CLI for Meraki switches. When you deploy all of your switches, they sync and register the cloud, just like the MX and the MR devices. And from there, you can manage them. Most of the switches provide application level visibility that is up to layer seven of the OSI model, wherein you get to see the different applications that are flowing through your switches, which is pretty cool. You can do something called as virtual stacking rather than physical stacking. So physical stacking is uh, a concept wherein you have multiple chassis of switches, right? So if this one and this one were to be bundled together uh, through a physical stack, you would get additional ports through a single management interface. However, virtual stacking is like having one physical switch, you can divide this switch into logical segments and you can have sub switches on the same one, right? So that feature is provided in Cisco Meraki switches. Automatic upgrades through your cloud UI, right? So you can provision updates upgrades and also schedule them like you know if you have new firmware versions coming up once every month once every quarter you can schedule them and you can automatically upgrade them without you having to bother and manually upgrade them just like other devices they support zero touch provisioning wherein you plug in a switch in your network maybe a non-technical person plugs this switch into your network and you may have like a DHCP in the in, in your LAN segment and they'll get an IP address and they'll automatically register to the Miraki cloud as long as they have outbound web access. All right. So you don't need to set up interfaces. You don't need to set up VLAN tags and stuff. It first registers to the cloud and you can directly access it later and set it up. You get enterprise grade security wherein it natively supports 802.1x protocol for port security. You can do storm controlling and we'll have a look at many of those features in just a second. So all of those features are baked into your Meraki switches right out of the box and you don't need any separate licensing and stuff. Since it is registered to the cloud, it provides you with remote troubleshooting tools like, you know, packet captures. You can run uh, diagnostic tools, you know, to detect any issues, loops. You can view event logs and there are a ton of features that you can actually use at your disposal that are available on your Meraki cloud dashboard and you can troubleshoot events on your switches. In this lecture, we're going to talk about the physical appearance of a Meraki switch or an MS device and out here and over here I have a Meraki MS120 which is an 8 port PoE switch as you can see so on the top how it appears is you have a nice Cisco logo there's nothing else if you flip towards the side we have these vents for cooling because it's a fanless switch it doesn't have any active fans inside and if we look towards the other side as well, we have uh, vents as well for the airflow. If we flip towards the rear end, 
we have this serial number, MAC address and the model number which is a Meraki MS128 port switch. Towards the end we have this power connector where we have to plug in the adapter for the switch to receive power. We have a Kensington lock that you can use to secure this uh, switch in a secured place. And at the bottom we have this sticker for the additional details for model number, the power consumption and any other regulatory information. And we also have this bracket where we can flip this way and have these used as mounting points that you can use to mount this in a rack or anywhere that you wanted to. However, we're going to place this on a desk and I'm going to close this out. Looking at the port configurations, we have 8 ports in total because it's an 8 port switch and it is PoE and all of these are 1 gigabit ports. So they can power so they can provide power over Ethernet so you can connect voice over IP phones, Meraki MR access points so I can connect uh, the uplink to this and uh, not use any power adapter for that. I also have two SFP ports and these are 1 gigabit too. So I can install a transceiver in these and provide an uplink to other uh, and provide uplink to other switches as well. And what we're going to do next is take the power cable and plug it in. in the power port. And once we do that, we have this LED indicator turn red. So let's give that a minute and let it boot up. So just like the other Meraki devices, it would cycle through different LED indicators to show you the different progress. Right, so we'll give that a minute. All right, so now the LED is flashing different colors. As you can see, it's going through different colors. And what we're going to do next is take this Ethernet cable and plug it into port number one so that the switch has an uplink and it can reach to the internet so that we can connect this to the dashboard and perform the other configuration. In this section, we're going to talk about Cisco Meraki Systems Manager or SM as we call it in abbreviation. Now, what SM or Systems Manager is, it's nothing but a mobile device management platform or MDM, or in other words, it's also called as an MAM platform. This is a cloud delivered service, all right? And it is used to control all of your mobile devices, including your phones, tablets, iPads, and also laptops. You don't have any infrastructure that is put in place inside your organization so everything is delivered through cloud so here are some of the quick features and what it actually does so it's a cloud-based mobile device management and you can provision devices and control mobile devices wherein you can deploy agents or set them up in your systems manager cloud console and you'd be good to go in handling them managing them and provisioning them you can monitor various mobile devices when they connect to your network, uh, what software they have on them, if they're jailbroken, if somebody has tampered with them, even when they go anywhere in the world, you'll be able to track them up. Now you can secure all of your mobile devices from unauthorized use as in like theft and somebody is jailbroken or rooted an Android phone. You can remotely wipe if a device is stolen to remove all of your company data to avoid any risk and you can enforce access. You can secure your BYOD or bring your own device type of policies that you have put in place in your organization so that you ensure that only healthy devices connect to your network. You can deploy it on contract worker phones and laptops when they come into your organization to work on various projects and things like that can provide deeper level of security for guest users and guest devices. 
in a seamless self-service portal for all of your users. So these are some of your quick features that are available in Miraki Systems Manager. So quickly talking about some of your terminology and some of the terms that we'll be using extensively throughout this module are tags. So tags are nothing but just names, right? So names that are associated to connected devices, profiles, applications, services, and things like that. So these are uh, associated to things like objects. All right. Then you have your apps. Now apps are nothing but your actual applications, whether if it's on the phone that is installed through the app store on iPhones and iPads and Google Play Store for Android phones. You also have something called as a profile. So a profile is something like a setting or a collection of settings. Whether if it's tied to restrictions like on an Android phone, they can only install specific apps. They can only uh, access applications through VPN, uh, Wi-Fi and things like that. So these are settings that can be deployed on your managed devices. And lastly, you have security policies, which is a set of rules that would be enforced and applied on devices when they connect to your network. All right. Now, before going any further, let us quickly understand why you need MDM in the first place, like mobile device management. Why do you need it? Now you need to have a security policy in place first before even deploying this on your network. Now your security policy would dictate like uh, for your organizational assets and business information, you need to ensure that your device is clean. You need to make sure that it is company provided. If you're getting your own device, it should be hygienically proven. It needs to have certain settings and things like that. So your security policy would dictate and govern that. And this is an absolute must. You have to have this first and this normally is signed off by your top level management. So tomorrow, if any of your users come back and say, uh, I'm not installing this SM agent on my laptops and things like that. So you'd always have an upper hand in providing the security policy, which is approved by the management and enforce all of your security. Now coming back, why you need to have MDM? Now there are essentially two cases. You have BYOD and your company approved devices or company uh, purchased. Now company owns these, right? Company owned devices. Now, if you have your business out here and all of your information, all of your crown jewels, everything out here, you typically would move to cloud services and things like that. Now you would want to make sure that all of the devices that are connecting and accessing this information are hygienic and they are not infected by any malware. So all of our devices can be classified into two categories. One that is a personal device. So bring your own device and one that is a company owned and managed by the company administrators. All right. So when these users use their own personal devices to access this information, you need to make sure that there is no malware. They're not jailbroken or rooted. And why this is important is because if you jailbreak an iPhone or root an iPhone, uh, sorry, root an Android phone, you, ens you essentially break the integrity of that device. So you'd no longer know if the firmware that you're using is a trusted firmware or not. It may contain like a root kit. It may contain like a backdoor that would provide malicious user access to this corporate information. And you don't want to do that, right? And for company users, when they connect, uh, when the users use company devices and access your business information, so I'll note this as business, you need to make sure that users don't install anything personal on their company provided phones and a company provided devices. 
and don't mix up anything. So you need to make sure that only your company data is on your company provided phones. Whereas on your personal devices, what happens is you create something called as a container, right? So this is your personal and this is your business. So on the same device, you have two containers. So in this space, all of your personal information, like your photos, your videos will be residing and in your business workspace, you'd only have emails, documents that are associated with the business residing. So this data cannot cross into this one and this data cannot cross into this one. All right. So this is like a logical segregation. However, in the company device, it is entirely dedicated to your company resources and you cannot have personal information. So in order to control this, you need to have mobile device management. And lastly, the very, very important one is theft or loss of a phone or a mobile device. So irrespective if it's a personal phone or a company phone, if it was accessing the business information and if it is stolen or lost, you need to make sure that you wipe all of your company information from the phone and make sure that it doesn't fall in the wrong hands like a competitor or any malicious user that could leak out this confidential information. All right. So in order to wipe and securely uh, remove that information, you need to have that device enrolled in MDM. All right. So this is a brief highlight on why you need to have MDM in the first place and devices connected to this mobile device management platform. Now for Cisco Meraki SM, these are the device types that are supported. So you have Apple iOS based devices, which are your iPhones and things like that. You can also support iPads. You can support Mac OS based devices, TV OS, Android phones and Android tablets, Windows laptops, Chromebooks. Now I have excluded uh, desktops and other uh, rigid machines that are non-mobile because they are present in your offices and things like that. But if you wanted to add the Meraki SM uh, mobile device management on that, you can do it. But essentially it is not installed because they are not mobile and they are only stationary. Now here is a quick update on how to plan out on deploying Cisco Meraki SM. Now we're going to start off with iOS, iPad, Mac OS and TV OS, which is for Apple based devices. Before you enroll and add devices to your MDM platform, you need to make sure that you have the APN or Apple push notification service enabled, right? And that is used to communicate between Apple device and your Cisco Meraki cloud and the enrolled devices for all the notifications, essentially push notifications. And you need to have a token to enroll and manage all of your devices that is tied through a certificate. And we'll be having a look at how to do that when we are on onboarding or enrolling iOS based devices. Now I noted this as a required step because this is mandatory, right? So without this, you will not be able to enroll any iOS, iPad or Mac OS devices. There's an optional step out here, which is uh, it, it is a two part process where you can enroll an iOS or iPad devices through supervision mode. So supervision mode is the mode wherein the devices are owned by the organization and you have absolute hundred percent and full control over these, right? And these devices, when you're enrolling need to be factory reset. So all of the data, when you are enrolling them will be erased. And this will provide you with the highest level of administrator and privileges when it comes to mobile device management, it will give you all the firepower that you would need to manage them. So device supervision is that level. And the options for supervision is that you can enroll for DEP, which is device enrollment program, wherein the organization permanently manages the Apple devices and it gives them most control. So users don't have any choice or personal control over them. So organization administrators would have full authority over all of those devices. 
including personal information if the users are storing on it. The other alternative to DEP is Apple Configurator, wherein we enroll and supervise Apple devices manually because some devices may not qualify for DEP. All right. You also have some other features called VPP, which is Apple Volume Purchase Program, wherein you centrally purchase, manage, and uh, own all of the application licenses for Apple devices, and you silently push them without any user interaction. Now, why this is important is because, uh, let's say you provide a company phone to a user, and after using it, the user doesn't return it, right? So whatever uh, software that you had purchased actually goes along with the user. So in order to prevent that, you can revoke all of those licenses and ownership and bring it back to your uh, central repository. And that can be done through your Apple volume purchase program, VPP. All right. And lastly, you have the Apple School Manager or ASM. And this is relatively tied to your education systems, schools and colleges that provide uh, school managed or college managed devices to their students right and pardon me it allows to create so i missed out c out here so my apologies so allows to create managed apple ids and utilize apple classroom apps for controlling student devices this is especially uh, useful for schools and other teaching environments now this is for apple based devices and if you don't want device supervision mode, you can always fall back to the uh, BYOD mode, wherein it creates containerization, wherein containerization, if I can write here. So your personal space and your business space is segregated on the same device, right? And the company doesn't have access to personal information right and this personal information cannot access business resources so they are completely segregated all right moving on to the next one which is for windows and android based deployments for so for windows and mac os you need to have the agent that is deployed now, agent deployment is highly recommended for the laptops, irrespective of its uh, Apple laptop or a Windows laptop, because it provides you with more features that are unavailable if you register it through a service portal, All right? It gives you things like remote desktop and remote controls, all right? Obviously, Windows 10 and Mac OS can also be enrolled via profiles, wherein you go into the settings and uh, join them to your Meraki SM, but agent is recommended to get additional features. Now, again, just like your iOS devices, Android also supports two modes of enrollment with called BYOD, which we talked about, and device owner, right? So a device owner mode of enrollment is for devices that are owned by your organization. And these are personal devices. Now for BYOD, a separate work profile is created, which is a containerized space. And that's, that space only contains business data, right? And applications data is encrypted within this container. Device owner based uh, enrollment uh, provides, provides full control and full functionality for the organization owned devices and their administrators. And lastly, you have the Samsung Knox. These are applicable for specific models of Samsung phones only. In this lecture, we're going to understand how we can provision, set up and deploy Meraki Systems Manager or SM and link it to our dashboard. So we're going to sign into our dashboard out here and I'm interested in deploying my systems manager on my SecureWire corporate office so that I can have most of the devices located at my corporate office. Alternatively, you could create a new network by going into organization wide and create network just for the systems manager, just for the systems manager. So we're going to do just that. So we'll go into create network and let's say I call this 
secure wire. Oops. Managed or managed or let's call this MDM. Right. And we're going to call this network EMM or systems manager. As soon as we selected this, we got a pop up here. You have a systems manager license, which is a prerequisite before even having deployment of the Meraki systems manager. And we have a total of 100 devices that we can manage. So let's go ahead and create this network. Great. So now that we have created that network, we are now into the secure wire MDM network. All right. And we'll close this stop notification. And now it is asking you to get started and add devices. And before we add devices, there are some devices that you have to set up some prerequisite first before enrolling them. And these are marked in yellow iOS device, which is your mobile phone for Apple Mac OS, whether if it is um, an iMac or a Mac mini or any of the computing device and you have Android. Just like how we talked about in the lectures, we talked about managed devices, which are hybrid or you can say uh, personally owned uh, Android phones or iOS devices that are used in the corporate office. Or you have the second option, which is a phone or a device that is completely owned by your organization. So you need to plan out your systems manager deployment accurately. And in this lectures or in our lab, we would be setting up personal devices that are also used for work purposes. So we're going to create a work profile on all of these devices. If you look on the iOS side, things are a little bit different. So we need to create something like an APN. So in here, we need to support Apple's push notification service. And in order to do that, we have to set up some CSR and uh, link uh, this to our Apple portal or through our Apple ID. And it is recommended to use your business Apple ID and not somebody's personal one. So we'll sign up for one for secure wire. So we'll use this link and create an Apple ID for ourselves. So I'll quickly sign up. So I've entered majority of my personal details here, created an Apple ID username and assigned a password. And I just received an email notification asking to enter the code. So I'll enter it out here and move forward. Great. So we have set up our account or a business account for secure wire on the Apple portal. And as you can see, make sure you don't use any personal accounts because if you wanted to recover any data or do any sorts of investigations, you need to have this access to this Apple ID. Otherwise things would just not work. So let's go back to our Meraki dashboard. And the first step is to download the certificate signing request or CSR. So we'll download this. And now we're going to click on this button on the Apple side to create a certificate. You can read through the terms and conditions. Accept this. And in here, I'm going to browse through my CSR. Once I've located my CSR, I'll just attach it out here and I can create a note. and upload. All right, so that is confirmed and services mobile device management. Meraki is the vendor and it's going to expire in one year. 
we also received an email notification from Apple regarding the certificate. All right. And you need to generate a new certificate once this is expired. So you may get like uh, updates or reminders when the current certificate would be expiring next year. Great. So now we need the certificate that was created and we're going to click on download to download that cert. And when I clicked on the manage certificates, it is now showing me the current certificate expiration date. You have this button out here to renew and you also have a button to revoke if you move to a different Apple ID and if you want to if you wanted to start things all over again. So we'll go back to our Meraki dashboard. We're going to key in our Apple ID. And we're going to choose the file or the certificate that we just downloaded from our Apple portal. Great. So we'll click on save and that's going to validate things. And it's going to give a check mark and it's saying push notification certificate is configured correctly and expiration date, Apple ID and Apple push topic. If we wanted to test this out, we can click on this button and test the certificate to make sure we don't have any errors. So this is valid. So we're going to click on next and we have our prerequisite for Apple devices set up. We're going to talk about all of these options when we talk about uh, the enrollment for Apple based devices. All right. So more on this later to do some additional configuration. We're going to come into systems manager configure and click on general to complete and polish some of the existing settings. Network name would like to keep secure wire MDM and I'd like to change this enrollment string. So what enrollment string is you get a unique URL and when users click on that unique URL, the devices would be automatically enrolled. And what I mean by that is if I go to systems manager and add devices in a new tab, and if I click on iOS devices, if you notice out here, I have a nice URL that I can pass to my users. And when they click on this, they would be automatically enrolling the devices rather than me grabbing hold of the devices, scanning the QR code or manually installing anything. And this appears to be a little confusing or, you know, it's a little too long. So what we'll do here is we'll change that. And to change that setting, you can enter your own custom enrollment string. So we'll put here secure wire MDM and we can enter some notes network for managing all mobile devices that access corporate resources. Now, corporate resources could be anything like email, uh, documents, uh, collaboration tools. And I have the organization admins automatically added to this. If I wanted to add an additional administrator only for this network, I can very well do that here. Enter the email address. All right. And we're going to leave all of these additional security parameters like Duo SEP. And my network location is in India. And let's do this real quick. And preferred network agent. Now I want to keep it latest and greatest. 
So make sure you select the one that is latest in order to have best configuration and options. We'll leave all of these default, right? And we're going to touch base on some of these settings when we talk about portals and uh, policy creations. So let's see down here if we can change something else. Now, here is some interesting setting which is called authentication for enrollment. You need to make sure that this is enabled. Now, this affects only enrollment, right? When users try to enroll devices, they would be prompted for authentication. This is very important to enable. Otherwise, somebody else with the URL would be able to publicly reach out to our MDM and register devices. Now, that is something that we don't want. We're going to skip allow multi-user authentication. So we're going to make sure that it is only tied to one particular user. Now, do we need to restrict our users only to confine them to specific IP addresses, right? So if you wanted to do that, you can add an IP range of this would be a public IP range from where they would be coming. Maybe this may be your office where your users are sitting inside and they would be enrolling their devices from there. So this option is available just to minimize the attack surface and not expose your entire Meraki portal to the internet. But I'd like to keep it and allow for enrollment for all IP addresses. Do I want to quarantine devices when they are being enrolled? No. So let's keep this disabled. And we're going to use SSL client certificates by default. So we're going to leave this default. And there's a default tag called recently added. So we'll leave this as well. Network discovery. Uh, I'd like to keep it enabled. So we'll uncheck this. And we'll not enable Apple user enrollment because uh, it would reduce some of the features and functionality. All right. And under access rights, we're going to leave everything enabled for iOS and Mac. Uh, some of the features that are restricted by default are remote desktop, uh, screenshot, silent remote desktop and command line. So we'll keep it enabled. The reason why these are added is because to enable user privacy because you don't want somebody to RDP into somebody's uh, computer uh, if you don't have explicit permission at that moment. If you wanted to, you can remove this. So it's up to you. So let's remove remote desktop because if you wanted to demo something, we can uh, see this. So we'll remove remote desktop. Command line, silent RDP and screenshot grabbing. Let's keep it disabled. All right. When I say disabled, it means that users are secured and their private information is kept secret and administrators cannot do these functionalities on the managed devices. Android device admin, let's keep this uh, enabled. This will help us to remotely wipe data that we own for the corporate for Android devices. We also have a self-service portal for different users. Now, if you wanted to enable this for the new users, you can actually do this. So let's go ahead and enable this. And new users, uh, let's keep it uh, default deny, All right? And this is my portal link for the self-service portal. So let's go ahead and enable branding on this and add our logo. So I have uploaded a nice logo and we can provide an alternative text out here. So we'll just call this secure wire. All of this looks good. And we're going to leave this default setting default deny for trusted access. And since we don't have Cisco ice, we are not going to touch this setting. So we're going to go ahead and click on save changes to commit our changes. And now we have all the changes saved. The last setting out here is the authentication related setting. And since we enabled authentication for end user enrollment, when they enroll new devices, you have a couple of options out here. I can either authenticate against the Meraki hosted accounts, which are local accounts that I can define here. There's an option for active directory. 
that we had seen in the past for Meraki MR and MX. So you can set up your own LDAP or AD server where you can enable user authentication based on Active Directory. You can use Google Sign-In and Microsoft AD or Azure AD. And you can also use OpenID to connect your own OpenID Connect server. For now, we're going to only use Meraki MX hosted accounts just to make things simple. And let's click on this button, configure Meraki hosted users, just to create a single user that we're going to use to test out our devices. And I'm going to click on add owner. And let's say I add, I'm just going to create a test user. And let's provide Keith's email address just to have a valid email here. And username is going to be Keith. Password, let's key in a password. All right, so once we have this password, I'm going to keep all of the other options default and allow this self-service portal access. And click on save changes. So this way I have one account that I can use for testing. So let's go ahead and click on save to save the changes. All right. In a production environment, what you can do is move this systems manager in a network that has an MX or an active directory where you can have active directory based authentication, just like how we saw in the MR and the MX videos where you can set up AD based authentication for your organization. So let's create only one user just to simplify things and how we can test it out. Alternatively, you can set up a CSV file and import all of your users. It would display the format that you need to uh, kind of use in order to make sure that uh, the, the syntax is correctly set up. So if you're interested to learn more about that, head over to Udemy um, through the link given in the description below. Have fun.